Oh, wow. He's back. I can't see him. Mark, can you see? Oh, there he is. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I, I see him and hear him. Oh, okay, I see him and hear him. So, uh, yeah, so, 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 Andrew, is this your first Twitter space? <laughs> it is. I never heard of it until about uh, 30 minutes ago <laughs> when you mentioned it to me. That, that's awesome, dude. Wow, it's so, a game changer. Yeah, it's a game it's a, changer. It, yeah. Yeah, because I was watching your blog and, um, you know, guys, you know, I put I put his his uh, his website up. If you haven't gone to it, definitely check it out. You can actually get his book free. So so Andrew retweeted mine and then um, there's a place to get it free as well. And I was looking um, I was watching your blog and then you're talking about your Facebook stuff and about joining, which if you guys haven't gone to his, his website, definitely check it out. I'll I'll put it up in the nest here in a second. Um, and what the nest is, Andrew is just above us. Um, if you're in the speaker box, you can put stuff into it's, they call it the jumbotron. They call it the nest, whatever they call it, but there's, you know, you, you can put pictures and videos and stuff up there. So we're going to put, I'm going to throw some stuff up there. Cause there's, there's a, there's a shooting that happened in Houston today, which, uh, which I'm looking to get, uh, some feedback on. And then obviously there's that turnstile with the cop and um, the cop and the kid, which I just put up in the a top. So that should be up there. The first one will be a New York Post article I just put up, guys. You can see that. The next one is going to be the actual shooting of the female um, at the – looks like a Camry or a Corolla. So that's going up there right now. You'll, if you look up above, you should be able to see that one now. So, should I be looking at my? You have, you have to keep in mind you're dealing with a technology idiot. So, <laughs> yes, um, keep looking at your phone. Just, just go up. Just scroll okay. up. All now. right, now, right now, I see something. New York City. It looks like PBA. There okay. Yeah, right. there you go. And I'm putting the third one up there now, which is the 60 second fight between uh, this kid who turned out to be a teenager. And this cop who's, I would, uh, who, who the, I mean, the teenager actually had him in a headlock here and, uh, things, things could have gone bad, uh, at the turnstile there. So, um, so if you guys, um, so they're up there. So the, so the, for me, the far left one is the 60 second fight between the kid at the turnstile. The middle one is the daily sneed where it's the female that uh, pops off two times at another car. And the third one is going to be the NYC PBA. If you click on that, that's just going to, that's just going to be an article about the kid at the turnstile, um, where Eric Adams, the mayor from New York spoke about, uh, this juvenile saying he was previously arrested for possession of a loaded gun and robbery. And he's currently already back out. So, um, we have Andrew in here guys. So if you can, once again, just retweet for me in the bottom right if you hit the plus that'd be fantastic um so andrew for people that don't know you um you know hopefully we we can get you on our podcast one day when you have more time i know you're short on time but for people that don't know you in here who um hopefully will follow you tonight um can you give us the 30 to 60 second background i certainly know who you are but can you let our people know tonight Sure. So I'm an attorney. Uh, I do really criminal defense work. And my focus is exclusively on use of force law, which is a very unusual focus. To my knowledge, I'm the only criminal defense attorney who has that exclusive focus on use of force law. It's all I do. I don't do DWIs or shoplifting or anything that doesn't involve use of force. It's been that case for, I mean, I just hit my 30th year practicing law. Um, and that's all I do. So I do uh, a lot of it is educational. I have books, I have courses, classes, and then we also do legal consulting to other attorneys on their clients' use of force cases. That's awesome. So um, the the cases that you take, um, and then plus there's emojis, which you'll see. Pe- you can see people clapping, so there'll be a clapping like that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you'll see people if they're laughing, they'll toss one of these up. Uh, they took away the uh, they took away the 100 sign, so you may get a lot of heart sign from people. They, there you go. Um, the hearts are people agreeing with you. And then uh, there's a peace sign here, it looks like. And then there's a wave. And then when, when people come up to the speaker box and they want to talk, we ask them to put their hand up, which they which they do by that, which I just did. So um, so 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 very cool practice. So let me ask you: um, when you say use of force. Are most of your cases where the client, your client, essentially says, I did it, but I was justified? Sure. So by use of force, I mean uh, defense of self, so self-defense, or defense of others, or defense of property. 
primarily defensive self and others, because those are the deadly force uses of force cases. You're, you're not really allowed to use deadly force in defense of property right. outside of Texas, of course. Uh, and, and self-defense as a legal justification, you know, we think of self-defense as a physical act. You defend yourself against some attack. But from a lawyer's perspective, it's a legal defense that you raise against some criminal charge, uh, usually a use of force charge, murder, manslaughter, aggravated assault or battery, misdemeanor assault or battery. And self-defense is inherently what the legal textbooks would call a defense of confession and avoidance. So it's not a more traditional legal defense, like an alibi defense, where you're saying, it wasn't me, I didn't do it, I was having dinner at my mama's house, I have an alibi. Uh, with self-defense, you're saying the opposite of that. You're not saying, I didn't shoot that guy. You're saying, I shot that guy. I did it. I killed him. But I did it with the legal justification of self-defense. So it's a defense of confession and avoidance because you're inherently confessing to the underlying physical conduct, but you're seeking to avoid liability on the basis of legal justification. Right. Um, so yeah, so very, very interesting practice. Um, I read your book. It's awesome, by the way. Um, oh, thank you. So yeah, it's absolutely great. Um, you know, we did plan for this tonight, so so I know you have to go soon and it won't be long. Do, do you happen to recall in Texas, you know, where you did mention that? And I, and I actually learned that not more than probably six months ago um, through a lot of jury trials and a lot of prosecutions now doing some other stuff, um, which I've, which I've disclosed to you. But um, did you happen to catch the case in Texas with Kyle Carruth? Kyle Carruth was the individual who was the smaller of the two men where the larger man showed up to get his daughter. And sure. okay. Do you remember that one? Yeah. I wrote about it rather extensively. Awesome. Awesome. So we had, so we had a space on that. We had a podcast on it too. Um, guys, I'll bring you up in a second. So we have some requests and I will certainly bring you up. So actually let me, let me bring you guys up now. And then I just want to talk to Andrew about that and then we'll open it up to our speaker. So nuance, I'll bring you up, Greg, I'll bring you up page, bring you up Nadim, I'll bring you up. All right. So you guys are connecting. So awesome. So, so you saw that one. So for people that were more in the space, which, which we tend to have a pretty good retention rate and, and usually a lot of the same people, um, the Kyle Carruth case, right? So that was a little different. And, and I learned something new that day um, when it came to, uh, you know, you know, I don't think it was so much defensive property per se in that one. You know, it wasn't like the case that we learned in law school where the person has that spring loaded gun at the door and they open the door to break in and you kill sure. him. But, um, you know, so, so Kyle Carruth was the one where he was the smaller of the two men. And, you know, from the video that's being taken from someone, whoever is in the truck, you can see Kyle arguing with the larger man who's there to get his, his, I believe daughter. Um, and oh, I'm sorry, no. I'm sorry, his son. Okay. And, the the deceased um he's arguing with his ex-wife and then kyle you know rather quickly you know has a conversation they escalate and then kyle goes inside comes back out he has uh what i think turns out to be a pistol inside um a i think it was yeah it's a pistol caliber carbine so. was it okay so but right but was it was it a was it a pistol caliber just carbine in general or was it was his was his firearm inside of the holder? I forget. Which uh, I think I think it was a, a carbine, but okay, okay. Either way, same caliber. Got it. Thanks, Mark. So right. So then um, they quickly have the conversation. He goes and gets it. He comes back out. He points it at the ground. There's an argument. Uh, the larger man, you know, does not take the hint or does not back away. Um, and you know, he's you know he says, "I'll take it." There's you know there's some talking about that. And then there's a, I guess we'll call it a warning shot, uh, shot at the feet. And then, he, uh, the larger man, um, goes to grab the long gun and kind of spins Kyle off of the patio. Kyle is then, I, you know, I'm guessing I never really looked into it too much about 12, 15 feet away, maybe 10 feet away. Don't know. He then shoots twice. Um, no one really reacts like the, gentleman got shot like everyone's just kind of just you know this guy falls then the person gets out of the truck she goes up there and then apparently they find out at that point that he truly has been shot you know he's wounded whatever happens because you can hear everyone kind of screaming and then it cuts out um so so that was for everyone who who i think mostly everyone here uh follows us on spaces in our podcast what was what was your take on that because you know we were 
we were split on on whether um because obviously self-defense and and you're more of an expert than i am in this you know i was i was with the state and with doj prosecuting so i didn't do it all the time but i had self-defense cases and i look at it as a whole but then i also look at it as a snapshot in time of when he pulled the trigger right so when you saw that and um kyle caruth who weirdly enough was divorced from judge in texas and then then they went to the grand jury who came back with a non-indictment it was kind of kind of weird a little bit but um what was your take when when kyle fired when kyle fired those shots yeah bad shoot that that's yeah that's what i thought that's what i thought so and by the way i know that's an i'm a lifelong member of the gun community i consider myself a second amendment absolutist i'm a guy Mm -hmm. who carries a gun for personal protection every day have my entire entire adult life so it's always awkward when i have to give these uh these uh, professional opinions that are unpopular in my own tribe uh but unfortunately a lot of people uh, interpret these cases from an emotional level that what they'd like the law to be or what they think a moral outcome would be here mm-hmm. um and when they do that they 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 want the shooting to be legally sound but it's just not so let me ask you so so and i think um and i do think and what i'm going to do is i am going to go to youtube real quick while we're talking uh, so Chad Reed was the larger, uh, man. That was his name. He's the, the deceased. There's a $50 million wrongful death suit against Kyle Cruz, but I'm going to throw up, um, I'm going to tweet then put up in the nest for you guys to look at, um, a couple clips here. So you guys, um, if you don't happen to remember it, you'll be able to take a look at it. So what I looked at Andrew was, um, and I think me and Mark went back and forth because, Mark, um, as soon as he hops in, he can tell you about himself, but uh, he's prior law enforcement. He's currently with the military. And um, we kind of went back and forth on this. And I think really the whole room that night did, did a lot of talking about it, in at least in our space. And, you know, I came to the conclusion that when he was tossed, when the larger gentleman um, tossed him 10, 12 feet away, and the larger gentleman, to the best of my knowledge, was never armed. Not only was there an escalation, but when he was 10 to 15 feet away, there was no imminent, there was no imminent threat of death or great bodily harm to Kyle to make that shot. Now right. that was, that, 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 that's correct. That's the key point. Okay. Uh, now there, there were times earlier in that confrontation when I think shooting him would have been lawful when they were struggling over the gun, for example, or, or right, right. apparently struggling over the gun. Uh, yeah, you can make a sound case for in that moment of time, there being an imminent deadly force threat. If someone's fighting you for their gun, it's no different than if they were picking a gun up off a table. In, in fact, it's worse because they're simultaneously arming themselves and disarming you. But that's not when he fired the fatal shot. When he fired the fatal shot, he was facing a man about 15 feet away who was not apparently advancing on him and who was unarmed. And that is not an imminent deadly force threat. Right. Yeah, so I took, I definitely took um, Adam. Great to see you, uh, Nuance. Great to see you. Let me bring Johnny up. Um, so yeah, so you know that's that's where I went on that. Um, if everyone goes up into the nest, if you go to the far left now, if you click on the tweet I just put up there, it's video.search.yahoo. It brings you to the video um, of the Kyle Carruth shooting that night. So um, so with that case, um, so I so and and Mark. Hop in, Mark. Yeah, just real quick. Yeah, so, you, so I know that me and you kind of differed on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but so so go, so go for your side, and then um, after that, I want to um, I want to take I want to get Andrew's take on the grand jury because obviously right, I think because right, right. you know because because yeah. going to the grand jury quite a bit, I know that you can persuade or put on evidence one way or the another of the grand jury. Sometimes, quite often a grand jury is used to indict. Right. But if I, I know I wouldn't be lying, you know, like you have your little police secrets. I got, I got my little state and my DOJ secrets. Right. There. Sometimes I go to the grand jury, um, hoping to come back with a non indictment or no true bill because now the grand jury has shielded me and our office from the political pressure to prosecute. Right. Um, so, so go ahead, get, you know, give your take on that. Cause I know that me and you went back and forth and Andrew, Feel free to hop in with Mark. So go ahead, Mark. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, it's uh, been a while. Wasn't prepared to do the crew tonight, but that's okay. I think I can because 
uh, there's some facts there that I found really hard to get around, right? One is, you know, of course, you have the property, but you can't blast somebody for property. I, I, well, I take that back in Texas, you sort of can. But the, but the larger issue there, uh, making it self-defense that I'm looking at, right? I just look at this. And he displayed his firearm, asked him to leave, told him to leave, ordered him to leave. Guy didn't leave. But some very significant things happen is he got tossed off his own porch. He got tossed off his own porch by his gun. He grabbed the gun in his, sho in his shoulder and tossed him. And so when I see that 15 feet, when I see that moment in time, I don't quite separate it ex exclusively or, or, or large enough to make it unlawful. I see it as a continuance. I see it as a massive act of aggression. You know, he didn't get tossed and then they, you know, they took a time out and that was the end of the round. You know, the, the fight was still ongoing. And if it wasn't ongoing, the question is, was it ongoing in the shooter's mind, right? His state of mind, was he in a fight? And then I think about the idea of him using a long gun to shoot a guy while he's being, while he's in a physical struggle with it. It's hard to do. But it's much easier to do once the guy doesn't have his hands on the gun. And then I just realize is, you know, I just think about is, you know, you do not have, if the guy's already touched your gun, he's already thrown you off your own porch. He already told you he's going to take it off you. And I forget exactly, but basically the word fuck was in there and, and him, right? So he's somehow going to fuck him up or fucking kill him. Or, you know, I don't remember the exact quote. You know, all, all that action happened in a continuance, in my observation, in my perspective. And then I would say that it goes to the shooter. Did, is it reasonable to think he had the same uh, logic, which was this is an ongoing attack. It, it, the attack didn't end. So that, that was my take on it. And evidently, the, you know, the court's take as well. Yeah, so there was no court. There was a, just a, um, a grand jury. But okay, grand jury. Uh, the, the proper, the, it's not the, and, and you're right, all that context and all that circumstantial evidence is relevant to the self-defense analysis. But the proper way to understand it is as an amplifying factor, all right? It doesn't have value in and of itself. So uh, if, for example, the victim had begun advancing on the shooter again, then that fight is still in progress. Then he's once again presented as an eminent deadly force threat. But what you can't do is use that prior context that no longer creates an eminent deadly force threat in the moment and shoot someone for what they did a few minutes ago. It can inform what they're doing now, but by itself, what they did in the absence of an existing eminent deadly force threat in the moment is not justification to shoot them dead. If the victim here had begun advancing again on the man with the rifle, I would have said that was a lawful shoot. But as long as he's just standing there, which is all I saw in the video, he's not presenting as an eminent force threat. So you have that amplifying context, but you're multiplying it times zero because there's nothing happening in the moment that's an eminent deadly force threat. Well, when I looked at it, 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 it certainly wasn't minutes, right? It was maximum moments. It doesn't think, matter. In the moment he when he seconds. pulled the trigger, when he pulled the trigger, what was the eminent deadly force threat in that moment? I see it. I, I see it. I see it in the perspective of him. You know, I think it's harder to imagine that this guy is not advancing. So, but Mark, well, he's not. He's not advancing. There's, well, I mean, there's no evidence between, that he's advancing. In between, in between every step. Hey, he, he, I saw him. Like he was take. He started taking a step forward. You know, I hear people say that, and I keep asking people to send me the video evidence of that, and nobody ever has. But if you can provide that to me, it'll change it's, my it's, mind. It's right, right when he uh, shot the guy. You, you see him shifting his weight to start taking a step. I, I just, I, I, I just don't see that. I have to be honest with you. Is, is there a weight shift of some kind? Maybe I don't see a step forward. Yeah, there's, there's two videos, guys. If you want to look at it, um, for. For those in the space tonight, there's an MSN one, which I just put up again, which will bring you to an article which has the clip. And then there's the one which is the video of um, which is also a video on Yahoo, which I think brings you to YouTube. But, but in, um, in any case, from my perspective, right. it doesn't matter mm -hmm. because I'm not personally invested in the conclusion here. So sure, my, sure. my point is there needs <laughs> right. to be some evidence in the moment that he's presenting as an eminent for eminent deadly force threat. If that evidence exists. Mm -hmm. Well, then he's presenting as an eminent de deadly force threat and the shoot's lawful. If the evidence doesn't exist, he's not. I don't care which of those outcomes is true. It doesn't matter to me. 
Right. I just follow the evidence. So if you folks feel that you have evidence that he was advancing in the moment he was shot, I would call that a good shoot. But I've not seen that evidence. I think I think, uh, you know, the evidence you've seen it. I've seen it. We know exactly, you know, you know, we're looking at the same thing. Uh, I think I think we're now down to individual interpretation because I, I interpret it as a continuous. I can I interpret it as there's nothing other than a threat, nothing other than advancement. So, so, so Mark, OK, so let me ask you this, though, because this is yeah. this is this this is us going back to the same thing we did last time, which I don't want to spend too much time on yeah, this. Yeah, I want ones too. Yeah, I got the other ones that I want to go through with Andrew, but I, I'll definitely go to the hands that are up sure. um, on this because we did because we did speak about Kyle Kruth. So so. You know, I, you know, I kind of said when he tossed him 10, 12 or 15 feet, you know, at that moment in time, whether he was taking a step or not, you, you know, we, we played it over and over and over or not. And, you know, we, you know, we don't know what, you know, what we do know is that when his body fell, it fell onto, um, onto the porch, right. onto the patio area, but one of his feet were off. So we don't know if that's how he fell or if he was taking a step off and then got shot and fell, because obviously he fell kind of down or backwards. Um, but I guess my point is, though, or I, I, I guess my question is, and then we'll just kind of move on from here to the hands just real quick, because I know that Andrew has to go soon, is at that moment when he's 15 feet away, 12 feet away, and the bigger man just swung him away, at that moment of time, what is the imminent lawful great bodily harm that is going to happen to Kyle Carruth at that moment in time? Not in three to four seconds when the man charges at him, if he charges at him, because then, as Andrew said, that would be a good shot. At that moment of time when he decided to shoot when the guy was still either one foot on the porch, uh, yeah. two feet on the porch, yeah. what, what, was his, what was Kyle's imminent bodily harm to himself or others? which would be the female to his right at that time when he shot. Yeah. Well, I think first thing is it wasn't, you know, even at 15 feet, that's not three or four seconds. That's like, like that's, that's zero to 1.5 at best, even slow. So, uh, okay. So one, okay. So one second, but again, sure, at that, sure. but, but at that moment in time, so I'm saying when he pulls the trigger. So th this, if we, if we want to break it down to the moments to that mm -hmm. level, then you're going to, then you could say, in between every round fired, there was no threat, right? Oh, he didn't pump the shotgun. He was only pumping the shotgun. Oh, he well, was only well, resetting the trigger. Well, the guy, he, the guy's attack is shot continuous him. in well, my in my view. Right, but his shots were back to back. Went boom, boom. No, oh, that's okay. Could have been boom, boom, boom. But he only boom, boomed. And you know, so right. So you know, when I look at that moment, I I really see it as as a continuous flow. It's strung together. Okay. He didn't. If now, if he got tossed. OK, which didn't happen. What I'm about to describe, if he got tossed and that moment was a five, six, you know, three second pause, you know, you know, think about it now, motherfucker. You know, did you like that? You know, I, I don't know. I'm making up because that's mm -hmm. what I'd have to do to make that moment separate from the continuing, in my view, continuous action, which was right. Uh, know, stepping up and right. I, the porch. I got what you're saying. You're yeah. saying that. You're saying that there's no breaking causation. I got it. Yes. So um, what, what, if, what if the two men are separated by 15 feet and the person who the victim is not advancing? Let's presume hypothetically. I know you feel you have video that shows he is advancing, but he's literally just standing there on the porch. The shooter can shoot him dead. State state of mind is 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 very important. And I, and I know, you know, I know you know this. Right. So, you know, if if who, who's state you, of mind are we talking about? The shoot the shooters. He has to have a reasonable perception of an eminent deadly force threat in the yeah, moment. Yeah, I can't imagine he doesn't. The guy's already said he's going to do this. He's already he's, stands. The victim's standing still 15 feet away. He's unarmed. He's always, and he's you're always, holding a rifle. You can just shoot him dead? Well, let's say he's, let's say he's, hold, he's standing still holding a hand grenade. But he's you know, not holding he's, anything. He's just, in this scenario, he's, just, he's not holding anything. He's well, unarmed. He has no the, weapon. But the question is, is he holding still? How long does still have to be? Well, right, I'm, right, I'm proposing right, a hypothetical right. for he's discussion giving, purposes. Yeah, I'm, he's I'm not trying to change right. the facts of reality. I'm saying right. hypothetically, if right. the man is simply standing still, unarmed on the porch, not advancing, would that be a lawful shoot with a rifle from 15 feet away? Depends on how long. In no. this case, <laughs> well, that, that's exactly what happened here. It's exactly what happened. So no, I mean, if he's not advancing, he's not an eminent deadly force threat to anybody. Right. So, Mark, the question is, which I think you get, I just don't know if because we have these all the time. Let's yeah, yeah. say let's say 
okay, so to even make it to even make it more blunt, and then I'll just go to the hands real quick because I know that Andrew doesn't, doesn't have much time. Let's say there's a two second pause, just this really awkward two seconds, and nobody moves, and then he shoots twice. Does that change it for you? Two seconds is pretty long. Okay, what about one second? There's it's one set. second pause, and then he shoots twice. He no one has moved. Is that a good shot? It, you got to look at the state of mind. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm. I mean, I'm uh, serious. Okay, but 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 it's like Andrew just said. What would a reasonable, prudent, ordinary person do under those circumstances? So so which is, that's, which is also not particularly easy to answer. But yeah. Well, but but that's what the jury instructions say. So you got to go with what the jury instructions yeah. say. Yeah. So, so if, my, I, if so, I were a juror in there, you know, I I look at I look mm -hmm. at I've looked at that video many 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 times, and you know, if if I were to time it, okay, I'm not the the best estimator of time. I'm better at distance. Uh, but you know, if I estimated a time, you just know, the give numeric, me the numeric just give value me, is not as important to me. Okay, just give me a so just give me a good shoot, bad shoot. Well, I think this is a good shoot, so I'll start there. Uh, okay. bad, bad shoot, in my mind, would be uh, when when the subject's actions, okay, or the, when I say subject, I'm talking the, the dead guy, right? Yep. When, when you know, because in my eyes, he's the aggressor. He just he just had a bad, bad day. He just lost, mm -hmm. right? right? So I look at his actions. If his actions, at some point, he had a change of heart and a change of action, and at the same time, the shooter you know, recognizes that, then you have, then you have a homicide then, or then you have a, you know, you have a murder versus a justifiable homicide. I just, you you're know. throwing all, you're throwing a lot of what ifs into people's heads there. Well, it, you know, state of mind is, 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 is very important here. Well, right. But okay. So let me go to Andrew. Andrew, when you talk about self-defense, when you put it on for your clients, can you talk to us real quick? And then I'll go to nuance on the hands. Can you talk to us about reasonable, prudent person versus and or and with also as well the the state of mind of your client? Sure. And state of mind is, of course, critically important. Right. Uh, but it has to be a reasonable frame of mind. And what the law means by reasonable is you're applying your powers of reason to evidence before you. It's not a speculative state of mind. It's not an imaginary state of mind. It's not a hypothetical state of mind. It's not who knows what his state of mind was? That's not the analysis. The analysis is what evidence was presented from which a reasonable person could achieve a conclusion. And in this situation, the question would be, what was that victim doing in the moment that a reasonable person would interpret as an eminent deadly force threat in the moment? If the victim was advancing on the guy with the gun, I think a reasonable person could conclude, given the context, he's continuing that fight. If he's standing still and not advancing, I see zero imminent deadly force threat. And I'm not, I don't know which is true because right. I, you guys apparently have seen video I haven't seen. I'm open to either interpretation. But yeah. to me, that's the key question. It's tough. I mean, we've looked at it over and over again from both. So there's someone filming inside the house and there's, there's someone filming in the truck. And we tried over and over and over, and we played and it in slow mo. And we do really want and, the the, uh, and, the mother's footage, which we don't have. That's right. So, yeah. so you know, it's also tough. So, I guess last question, then I'll go to nuance. Um, what's your take on the grand jury um, in Texas, which simply said uh, that there was nothing to indict on? Obviously, you know, me and you, or when I saw it prior, and then us speaking today, um, you know, we both believe that there should have been an indictment. But um, do you think this is one of those where they saw anything and everything in the grand jury? Well, I, I, I don't know that there should have been an indictment. That, that's not I'm, I'm not okay. saying that. Okay. I think we need to separate these into two different levels. So sure. uh, on one level, you have the uh, the legal merit of the argument. What mm -hmm. does the black letter of the law apply? Uh, allow, I should say. Sure. Uh, what could happen? What's the worst case legal scenario for this defendant if he's charged? What legal argument can the prosecution make? Does the prosecution, if he wants to, does a grand jury, if it wants to, mm -hmm. have sufficient evidence and legal merit to return an indictment to achieve a conviction in a criminal trial? A lot of times the grand mm -hmm. jury or the prosecutor could have that but they choose to use their discretion not to use it. The right. grand jury chooses not to indict. The prosecutor chooses not to charge and bring someone to trial. That happens all the time. Mm -hmm. That does not mean there was not legal merit. That's a different question. That just means, you know, the law is not just a, it's not a computer 
where you crank right. the handle and some machine decides what the legal fate is. It's it's a it's a it's an institution run by human beings. So there's a lot mm-hmm. of human decision making and discretion that's applied. I think it was not unreasonable for the grand jury here to choose not to return an indictment. This is their community. Maybe right. they this is the outcome that they want. I don't hold that against them by any means, regardless of what the legal merit. That's their role in the system. Uh, but that's right. a separate question from whether or not they could have returned right. an indictment if they wanted to. They had right. the merit for that. Okay, so that was going to be my question. So they had the merit because I've done more grand juries than I can count. And depending on what we show or who we present, usually it's just an agent or an officer and um, – maybe a video or whatever. Right. So but, really it's a very extremely prejudiced. Format, exactly. Right. Exactly. Because they, very, they, they really only hear, I mean, I'm they, generalizing, but for the most they hear part, the worst of one only side. Hears one side of the argument. Yes. And anytime hear, you hear one side of the argument, it sounds pretty compelling. Correct. They hear, they hear the worst of one side, unless we're using the grand jury for a shield. So my question in this case is we don't know. I wasn't there. No one was there. Do you believe that they, were given, or if you had to speculate, which this will just be a toss up real quick and then we'll move on. Do you believe they were shown every and all angle to it? Or do you think they were shown what the prosecution wanted to show them? Cause there, again, I've done, I've done hundreds of them. There are times we only show certain things. And if you've been in a grand jury long enough and some people sit for six months, it is amazing how in the first month, everyone's attentive, everyone's paying attention. And in month, Number three, everyone's walking around doing potluck and not paying attention to your PowerPoint, not paying attention to your agents. So things change drastically with the grand jury. So I don't know if this was a special convened one or if they were already sitting. My question is, um, so you think there was legal merit, but then as far as a grand jury goes, kind of their discretion? Yes. So, I mean, if the grand jury had wanted to, if the grand jury had returned an indictment, is there any way in which that indictment would have been perceived as sufficiently defective not to go to trial? I don't think so. Would, no. would it have been considered completely irrational and prejudiced? No. 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 So they had enough if they wanted to. Yeah. I got you. But what, right. what I always tell my clients is, listen, you, you can't you can't base your assessment of the legal situation on what will happen if you get a lucky break, if someone <laughs> uses their discretion in your favor. You have to assess your legal position from what if they want to throw the book at me? What's mm-hmm. the worst they can do with what evidence and law they have at their hands? And then if you get a break, it's just good luck. Uh, right. But see, it's very dangerous because many people learn their their use of force law, their self-defense law from these anecdotal cases. And they hear that someone didn't get indicted or someone didn't get prosecuted or someone didn't get convicted. And they conclude from that that what the person did must therefore have been lawful. Right. And that's not at all true. Uh, they may have just gotten a lucky break, a lucky grand jury, a lucky jury at the trial. Who, who knows? Uh, so you, you have to do the legal analysis on the black letter of the law, on the legal merits first, and then consider the human factors after. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I've had some cases where, you know, I thought I had more than enough. Um, and obviously if you've ever gone to trial more than a handful of times, you know, that nothing is ever a slam dunk or, you know, people who talk, talk that way, you can obviously tell that they really haven't gone to trial too much, but you know, I've had cases where I've had body camera footage, I've had DNA, I've had fingerprints and I've gotten a not guilty. And I'm like, what the hell did I just do? Well, what I did is maybe I didn't put on a great case, but more likely than that, I, I picked a horrible jury. Um, and then there's other cases where I've had a home invasion, they were masked up, but you know, the person who I put on him and his wife, they're both convicted felons, but they say that they know the person's build and the voice and the, the jury comes back and convicts the guy. Right. So, you know, I mean, I, listen, juries, juries are dangerous and unpredictable creatures. Yeah, and yes. I, we, we all use this phrase. We've all heard this phrase, jury selection and folks, uh, there couldn't be a bigger lie in the criminal justice system. Right. If I got to select my client's jury, I would never lose a case. <laughs> right. we, we don't select juries. We have a modest ability to deselect individual jurors, but we're largely stuck with whatever the jury pool gives us. Yeah, no, you're you are absolutely right. It's it's who can I strike for cause and then who do I have to get off my panel? And then when all of that's done and all your peremptories are done, it's who do we have left? 
Yeah, and, and when you strike somebody, you have no idea if the next person in line is going to be even worse. <laughs> right, right. So sometimes, you know, there, yeah, there have been times, and actually more times than not, probably where I haven't used all of them because I don't want to get to maybe the third row where I have two to three guys that I really don't want. So, you know, to avoid them, I don't strike the second row. So, so you know, so so I keep juror two, four instead of going to juror three, one or two, seven, because I really fucking hate that dude. So I definitely yeah, I don't mean, want him. People not in the profession don't don't know this because they'd probably be horrified. But there's a lot of noise in the system, folks. And juries are a big part of it. Uh, yeah. And I tell Every case I work on, I tell the client, look, some cases, they're, they're usually normal law-abiding people who went to the gun because they got scared, find themselves charged, usually with a very serious felony, or they wouldn't be paying me. Um, and I have to tell them, if they're offered a plea, they don't want to take a plea, because in their mind, what they, they can't believe they're getting prosecuted for self-defense in their mind. Right. Um, and so they don't want to even consider a plea. But I have to tell them, listen, if I put you in front of a jury, you could be the most innocent client I've ever worked with. There's a 10% chance you get convicted mm -hmm. if I put you in front of a jury. That's just the noise in the system. Right. And now where you practice is Colorado. Is that correct? Well, my practice, my legal practice is largely a legal consultancy. So my clients okay. are actually all other lawyers who are okay. lead counsel on their cases. So I work on cases all over the country. In fact, I'm not a member of the bar of Colorado. I just moved here a few years ago. I'm oh, still okay. a member of the bar in Massachusetts. Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah. Down in, you know, Obviously, down in Florida, which I'm sure you've had some, you know, you know, down here we have, you know, we have the 1020 life, right? So, you know, 10 if you hold it during yeah. a felony, we have the, you know, we have the 20 if you discharge, and then we have the, obviously the 25 to life if you actually hit the person. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, once that plays, once that plays. All right. So we do have Andrew um, here. It's great to have him tonight. I, I know he has to go soon, so let me bounce to the hands, um, and then we'll go from there. Nuance, you've been super patient. Thanks, brother. Great to see you tonight, bud. Likewise, uh, Andrew, I'm a fan of your stuff. Been watching for a while. I actually used your code, I believe, to for CCW Safe. So, I'm a oh, member. thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm a member of CCW Safe as well as another organization uh, that does similar stuff. But um, I do remember when the Kyle Kareth case happened. I I, I was disagreeing with you. I, I politely wrote something in the comments, and you kind of got angry at me. <laughs> it's all right. Mm -hmm. so. It could be. It's the internet. Yeah, but um, I, we, I know I, your, I guess your handle is nuance, but nuance is actually quite difficult on the internet. Yeah, so I mean, I think we also have to remember in Texas, it's not just like j lethal, deadly force being used is it's not only justified in the case of you know life and great bodily injury. It can also be used um, for a multi like you've talked about property. Um, there's a bunch of other exceptions like, um, sure, sure. But which of those were present at the moment the shots were fired? So uh, I'm, I'm trying to, I think. Cause you're quite right. I mean, defensive dwelling, uh, defensive personal property, well, aggra Texas aggravated uniquely. kidnapping, murder, sexual assault, aggravated. Sexual assault, oh, yeah, robbery, right. Sure. Robbery. Sure. Um, yeah, if, if any of those were in imminent progress at the moment, I would say the shooting was good, but I don't see those. Sure. I I've seen, other um, independent program attorneys, I think, make the case that uh, one of the actions of, you know, him gra grabbing the gun and then you know assaulting and removing him from his property, the curtilage. I know that's usually in like a Fourth Amendment context, but um, th I think there was something that it, it could have constituted that like in what in what he did but i i, I do agree that the, the timing matters when he's removed the, like obviously the, the gun grabbing and everything happened he was removed and it's a very short blip of time um i do think under the reasonable person standard 100 percent. like i mean i think that's why the grand jury found what they found it's like a reasonable person believes this person told me they're gonna kill me they advanced on me grab my gun just fling me from my property uh and you know I, I also saw the shifting of the weight as well uh, when I watched the video. I think it's completely reasonable, especially, you know, cops. It's like, what, 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 if when someone's 15 feet away from you, what, uh, you know, imminent deadly force do they post to you? It's like, well, cops are taught the 21 foot rule all the time when a suspect has a knife. I mean, you know, right. 15 feet yeah. is really not that far no, whatsoever. No, right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Someone advancing with a weapon can close that 21 feet in a second and a half is a tool or drill paradigm. Uh, but there is no weapon here. And there is, I mean, again, 
I'm assuming no advancement. I've already said several times, if you have evidence of advancement, that's well, that's fine. That would change my analysis. I just didn't see that. Yeah, I mean, if, I, I think if he stood still and raised his hands and said something like, I surrender, or just even raised his hands, that'd be a bit different than, you know, the shifting of the weight that I saw. Um, but also, I do think if... Actually, I, I would suggest a, a raising of the hands would be aggravating in favor of the shooter. Okay. Well, I, I mean, if it was like in a surrender pose, I, I, w- I would say it would... Um, but but um, I do think if this happened in another state, I absolutely think, for example... Um, you know, duty to retreat, uh, the initial, you know, bringing out of the gun uh, in Texas, that would be totally fine because that's not considered deadly force. What he did initially uh, with, you know, presenting the gun and bringing it out, which in other states, that would not be the case. So, right. so imagine you know, if we had the same law, but we imported a Massachusetts jury <laughs> to the grand jury. Do you think we'd have the same outcome? Uh, that's why I say we need to separate the legal I, merit from the human factor. Those I, I are don't two even different know, levels of analysis. I don't even know if it's the jury necessarily. I think it's, you know, the process, like they can kind of decide what to show and mm-hmm. how to, you know, present that's, it. Right. Them. So let, let's, per, let's pretend that the grand jury was presented with just the evidence we saw. Mm. I, I, I don't I don't know. I, I, I mean, a grand jury can indict a ham sandwich, but I mean, I, I don't know. I, I that it, that's stuff. That's stuff with the truth nuance. I've seen some uh, I've seen some crazy indictments on uh, some other people. But yeah, no, it's that's, you know, that's a good question. What do you think? Nuance. What do you think if um, if a D.C. jury, if a D.C. grand jury was brought in? Do you think it changes? Uh-huh. Well, <laughs> see in particular, DC. Um, I know. That's yeah, tough, I mean, right? I think DC. Yeah, they, they, they and, and just pretend pretend the black letter of the law was the same. So we have the same law right. to apply. We just have different people applying the law. Because I can imagine a Texas grand jury saying, "I don't give a damn what the law. You throw me off my Porsche, I'm going to shoot you." Right. Yeah, I mean, listen. I but mean, that, Kyle, that, Kyle that's not based on legal merit. <laughs> yeah, Kyle Rittenhouse was totally justified, but I, I could easily see a grand jury indicting him. And, you know, they, they ultimately brought charges against him and went mm-hmm. to trial and everything. But, um, oh, by the way, I want to, uh, you probably don't want to go to this yet, but I mean, Andrew is only here for a limited amount of time. But the, uh, the case in, I think, Houston, where the chick's shooting at the car, I mean, that's 100% unjustified. It, it mostly due to the last shot when, like, you don't even have to know what ha- happened really. Uh, but that last shot, when that car's super far away, I mean, complete negligence. Uh, yeah. So let me just, um, so guys, what nuance is talking about, it's up in the nest. If you go to the daily Sneed, uh, that one up there, if you click on that one, it says daily Sneed uh, handle is trooper. If, if, if you click on that, you'll see a road rage incident where a female, uh, pull, pulls out a firearm, shoots at a car trying to get away, probably two feet away. Then the car uh, goes forward, I'd say about 50 feet, 25 feet. It's tough to tell. Makes a hard right turn. And then she just literally brings up the gun with one hand and shoots. And there's a dealership behind the car. Um, absolutely crazy. So, yeah, Nuance, go ahead and go to that. And and we can ask questions on both on that. So do you have any background on that for us? Or is it just what we saw in the video, which is all I saw was a literally a 15-second clip of um, they're already out of the truck. And she picks up her her gun and she fires twice. Is there is there any background that you have for that? I have no background. I mean, the the background would be important in order to know what the exact uh, charges, right. like how high you would want to go up on the charges. Uh, but uh, it's clearly unjustified, at least for the final uh, act that she did. Um, but it would be nice to know more for sure in that circumstance. Yeah, that was a crazy video. And those two are definitely going to be identified. One guy is very big. He looks like, I think he's, I, if I recall correctly, he's bald. He's very muscular. She's got this humongous ass. She's in shape too. She's wearing like a crop shirt. They're definitely going to get identified. Uh, that's, 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 uh, that's a bad day for them. But all right, nuance. I'll come back. Um, let me hop down. Uh, Johnny, you had your hand up. You put it down. Do you want to go before I hop down? Well, Johnny? I'll just I'll just try and be quick. Go ahead. I think I think my question was answered. Uh, um, uh, first of all, I always thought that the the first shooting that we were talking about was always a bad shoot, primarily because 
Well, first of all, there were no reasonable people there. A reasonable person would have avoided the situation, but that didn't happen. Uh, the, th- the other thing is, at some, p- I mean, it's a verbal argument between everybody that's known. And then the guy leaves, and then he brings a gun to the verbal argument, and that's where things escalate. And I always thought, for me, that was, that was the crutch. He didn't need to bring a gun to that argument. Uh, but he did, and that's Sweetly when things justified. escalated. And, what, and I guess the answer is, that's Texas. That's what I'm gathering. Any place else in the union, he's probably uh, going to be convicted on a grand jury under the law. But Texas, it's justified to bring your gun to a verbal argument. Uh, it's on not your own property to present a <laughs> firearm. Well, it's one thing if it's hanging off your shoulder. Uh, uh, if it's one thing if it's holstered and you're having a verbal argument. Once again, when you draw that weapon, things escalate. Am I am I wrong there or what? And also, too, if you go to intimate threat, where was the intimate threat? Why did he bring? Where was the threat that he had to bring the gun in? Trespassing. So let me ask you, well, Andrew. He, he he doesn't need to be facing a threat to have a weapon in his hands on his own property. He's just allowed to do that. That's not a violation of the law. Right. So, Andrew, let me ask you what 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 I think Johnny is saying. Well, I guess in any state or just Texas. Well, I, I, I don't do gun law, but generally speaking, mm-hmm. you're allowed to have a gun on your own property. I mean, there's some states that require permits to even possess a gun in your own house, I guess. That was the case when I lived in Massachusetts, but it's certainly not the case in Texas. Texas, right. if you're if you're on your front porch, you're allowed to have a gun in your hands. Right. I think going to the moral of the argument, though, which I which I think, and Johnny, I'm, I'm just trying to help you out because because I know you for so long. I think what Johnny's getting at, what what Kyle did was an escalation. Would you would you agree with that, Andrew? Well, yeah. So, I mean, when you say to get to the moral part of the argument, I I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I understand that we're all human beings and we all have that view of events. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't do morals, though. I only do right. the law. So when, when we're looking at things and saying someone did something wrong, I'm looking at it from a criminal law perspective. So I, I just don't see a crime he violated there. Now, whether he escalated a fight on on his own front porch Mm -hmm. i I don't see any problem with him getting the gun and bringing it on the front porch i I have no problem with that at all my problem my problem with the case is at the moment of the actual use of force i don't see an eminent deadly force threat but uh prior to that not only do i think he was justified in arming himself if that's what he wanted to do on his own front porch he had opportunities to shoot that guy that would have been lawful Right. And he was also the tiny guy of the two. Cause when, cause when you look at the video, the other guy's twice the size, probably twice the weight. And that would come into, that would be right. relevant to fighting over the gun, for example. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Let me bounce around. I'm going to go down to Greg and then Paige and then SD. And then we'll see if Andrew has to uh, take off. Cause I know he's busy tonight. So Greg, great to see you tonight, brother. Hey, hello. Uh, so I have a question to Andrew, uh, especially about the uh, right for a uh, lethal force uh, in in uh, pretty much defense of their property because I heard that uh, a lot of people said that uh, it's not justified in any state except the Texas so let's take Texas out of the picture because I know you know Texas is a little bit different but if yeah, for- can, can I can I interrupt you just for a moment because yeah, there, there's an important distinction here when, yeah. when we're talking about property in this context we're talking I'm talking about personal property so items not yes. things like a dwelling. A dwelling's in a different category. So I'm not talking about defense of home. There's lots of states where you can use deadly force in defense of your home against an intruder, for example. But you can't use deadly force in defense of uh, an item of mere personal property. Okay, so th- this is my question. So hypothetically, so I do not live in Texas. I live in, in uh, I live in Minnesota. But like, let's say in the other state, he, like here's my conundrum. You know, I live in a house. Uh, I have a car that sits in the driveway in front of the house or like you know in the street right in front of the house yep in the middle of the night i hear a commotion i see someone breaking into my eighty thousand dollar truck uh breaking the windows trying to steal the stuff from the car or start trying to steal the car i go out of the i'll go out from the home middle of the night with my gun and now the person is not that he does not want to uh pretty much attack me he just wants to get my car so I'm like confronting the person. He's still breaking the windows. You know, he's still trying to get into the car. Do I have a right to use my deadly force, use my gun to, you know, pretty much take him down and 
recover my property or do I have to pretty much sit silent on my porch and watch <laughs> him break the windows, try to steal my car because he's not attacking me. He's just, you know, breaking to my car. Right. So when we, when we say use force, we, we, we need to uh, be clear on exactly what we mean. Do you mean, can you shoot him to stop yeah. him from taking stuff? No, nope. Yes. nope. no, right. so, not so, in the absence of a threat to persons, okay. which you said is not happening. Okay. And if there is a threat to persons, it's no longer a defensive property scenario. Then it's a defensive person scenario. So as long, so as long as he's not presenting threat to me, even though I'm armed outside of my home, per, uh, pretty much protecting my own property, which is the truck, I cannot do anything. I have to sit or stand next to him, well, you, watch, you, you, watch him, watch him break into my car and drive away. Correct? Well, that, that's not what I said. <laughs> so I, I speak very carefully. So what I said is you can't shoot him. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean you can't do anything. Yes. You could, for example, use non-deadly force to stop mm -hmm. him. Uh, you might be able to, and this varies by jurisdiction, threaten him with the gun, threaten to shoot him. That might be lawful. Uh, but there's a big difference between threatening to shoot someone and actually shooting them. Yeah, so it's not, it's not a matter of not being able to do anything. What I'm mm -hmm. saying is you can't do the ultimate thing, which yeah. is shoot him. No, I, I understand. But if the person is determined, he's like, I no, the person is not, even though I, you know, Try to frighten him. Try to you know draw my gun. I do not. No, nope, they're it. taking the stuff out of your truck and they're putting right. it in a bag and they're walking off with it. You cannot shoot them over that. Okay, right. Even though and not even taking the stuff of the truck. Like even like if they turn the truck on and try to drive away. Greg, I love uh, you to death. You cannot shoot him over a truck. I'm if he's, you if, can. If, if you were assuming there is yeah, not a threat. Uh, well, yeah, right, right. That that yeah that yeah that is true nuance. There is that uh, there, Texas qualification. There, Yes, there. But, yes, yes, there is that nuance very, out there. I would be very careful. I would be very careful, even in Texas. If you look at that Texas statute, and anyone who yeah. it comes up so often that I have a shortcut URL. So if anybody <laughs> wants to read it, lawselfdefense.com slash nine four two because it's Texas Texas Penal Code nine point four two. Yeah. Lawselfdefense.com slash nine four two. There are a lot of conditions. Some of them are time of day based like in the nighttime, for example, and they don't define what nighttime means. So is that dusk or dawn? Do you know? Would a jury know? Because it's not defined anywhere in Texas law. There are a lot of hoops that have to be jumped through for that justification for the use of deadly force in defense of personal property to be valid. And if the jury, not you, it's not your judgment that controls your legal fate. If the jury decides you fail to jump through one of those hoops, your justification fails and now you're just the guy who murdered somebody right oh i agree listen Pretty if much. someone's stealing a lawn gnome and it's like 6 50 p <laughs> don't risk it don't risk it right. like, look, i mean hearing all this stuff that the, the criminals have much more power than the law-abiding citizens trying to protect their property well greg i mean there's a lot of stuff you can do such as what you know i'm just thinking on the fly here right but you know again you know in some areas you can threaten to shoot um there are things I'm just I'm just thinking out loud, right? Um, if you approach him and then he comes at you, um, he may be armed, may not be armed, he may have something in his hands. Then possibly shooting is just justified. If it's you longer a defensive right. property it, scenario, that exactly. is a defensive person scenario. It, exactly. So now it's changed. So so you know I I so Greg, I get what you're saying, but I, I highly doubt if you come out there with a gun he's most likely either going to come at you or she is going to come at you or they're going to run away. They're not just going to stand there while you stand there and watch them, especially when you're on the phone with 911 or if you're videoing them. So, and as Andrew just said, you know, if they come out of your window and see you and, and you know, 90% chance they're going to run away. If, if that 10% happens that they're going to run at you, Especially if they have something in their hands and it's dark and you can't see, and you, and you are on your own property right by your house, you know. At that point, you know it is, in my opinion, and I'll go to Andrew real quick. In my opinion, now we're talking about self defense of yourself, and I think that's an okay shot. While someone is robbing you, you confront them and they run at you. Obviously, a lot of hypotheticals, a lot of stuff, of what if, but so, you know, that's I mean, listen, change. we have we have to be realistic about this stuff and. Mm -hmm. Anytime you go hands-on in a confrontation, you go to a fight. First of all, if you go to the fight, it doesn't look like self-defense to anybody. Right. Uh, if the fight comes to you, that's a completely different scenario. But anytime you get engaged in a physical confrontation with someone, you've just incurred two risks you were not incurring a moment before. One of them is the risk of dying in that fight. 
That guy robbing your car, maybe he does have his own gun. And maybe he shoots you in the face as you walk up to find out what's going on. What in your car is worth getting shot in the face over? I would suggest nothing. The second risk you run is Mm -hmm. you end up shooting that guy, winning the gunfight, and the prosecutor decides, you know what? This is one I want to take to trial. Maybe because you're white and the person you shot is a 13-year-old black kid. Right. And you go to trial and you're that 10 percent, no matter how innocent you are, you get convicted. And now you're in a cage for the rest of your life without possibility of early release. What mm-hmm. in your truck is worth that? Yeah. Folks, there, there are things worth dying over the risk of death. And there are things worth spending the rest of your life in prison over. But I doubt it's anything that's in your truck. That's a great point. Yep. That really is. Yep. That's a great point. Yeah, well, well delivered. Definitely well delivered. All right, let me go over to Paige, and then I'll go to SD. And then, um, if you want, um, Mark and um, Andrew, if you want to take a check at your DMs, uh, just if you want to give a response back, if you have time on that, I'm, I'm well, just trying. I'm good. I'm good yes. until uh, my wife comes to collect me. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. No problem. You don't have right. time then. <laughs> good. Good. Let's do it then. Um, I, let's let's. Can I ask a really really quick question? Greg, you are you Greg. are the man of double questions. Let me come back to you. I promise. Okay. Of course, of course yes. I'll come back to you. Thanks. Let me let me go to Paige first, and then I'll come up to SD. Hey, Paige. Hey guys, if this in the forum, shut me down. But um, and even being in Texas, I'm scared to carry my gun anywhere because everything's become so convoluted, and there are so many different hoops to jump through. And people are getting shot left and right, carjacked left and right here in Texas. Um, I'm an hour outside of Houston. I moved out of Houston, thank God. Um, the show, uh, I think, on, uh, on the blaze, Glenn Black, Glenn Black did a thing. Sorry, migraine can't speak. Glenn Beck did uh, an interview with a woman that um, the feds raided her house by mistake. Um, and, and took her, uh, they took her, she had a booklet of the constitution and they perceived that as a threat and took that, um, with people coming and knocking on your door to see how many guns you have. These are terrifying things. And if this isn't the right place to ask that question, again, I live in Texas and, I, I have my guns, but I'm scared to even take it outside the house with me because they're, I mean, I, I don't want to end up in prison for the rest of my life. So, sure. So, so, so let me go to Andrew and then I'll go to Adam. And I think Adam and nuance want to respond to that, but let me go to Andrew first and, and try to make that a concise question, which Andrew, I don't know if this is an area that you want to speak to, but um, I guess what I'm hearing is that, is it, Given given the risks associated with it for some people, not others, right? Um, is it worth carrying a firearm even if you have to use it? Well, I think it's a very personal decision. I mean, the, yeah. the risks you incurring it improperly, if you don't know where the actual legal boundaries are, are tremendous. Right. Uh, and most of the cases I work on are normal, law-abiding people, never been in trouble with the law a day in their lives, have a concealed carry permit had their gun on them, got scared, pulled their gun, didn't fire a shot, didn't hurt anybody, and are looking at 20 years in prison on a charge of aggravated assault with a firearm. Yeah. Because they And they think, if you put them on a lie detector machine and ask them, were you acting in self-defense? They'd say yes and pass. Yeah. In their heads, they really genuinely have a good faith belief they were acting in lawful self-defense. They just didn't know where the legal boundaries actually were. So, yes, if you're going to be carrying a gun and you don't know where those legal boundaries are, that is fraught with peril. That said, I'm a guy who carries a gun. I carry a gun every day. I have my entire adult life. I'm certainly not trying to scare people out of carrying guns. I do it. But if you're going to do it, you'd best do it in an informed way. I don't tell people what to do, but I do try to encourage people to make informed decisions. Got it. Well, I'm 5'6", 120 pounds, single female. Well, well, I mean, I think uh, depending on your size, your weight, and where you live, uh, you know, those are all things you have to to probably take into consideration. Um, And whether or not, you know, you have your own private security or if you don't, things like that. So, um, I mean, I'm 6'1", 200 pounds, and a man, and I carry a gun because I don't want to have to go hands-on with someone trying to kill me. Right. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a very personal question. Let me pop up to Adam and I'll come to you once. Adam, go ahead, buddy. Great, yeah. Great, great, I just, great to see you, too. It's uh, great to see you as well. And also uh, to be on stage with the uh, the great Andrew Br- uh, Bronco, <laughs> big fan. Um, a long time, first time. And I, I just want to I should bring my what... kids in here to hear all this praise. <laughs> they're they're yes. not quite as impressed with their dad. <laughs> Right. Well, you know, like that's what happens when, you know, kid, little kids don't understand that lawyers do big things, unfortunately, mm-hmm. for the rest of us. But um, jokes aside, but, you know, I think like just to expand upon uh, that is that a lot of people don't understand the law as it applies to them without necessarily talking just in particular on the firearm situation. And if you can't, you have to like take the time and impetus uh, behind it to actually like educate yourself on it, just to uh, expand on it. And this goes for everything, right? Like there is, there is like a lot of this law is actually written fairly clearly, especially in this uh, great state of Texas. Um, And like, uh, you should uh, take it upon yourself to be educated on what you can and cannot do uh, when it comes to your uh, firearm. But I just wanted to talk about the one point about like the feds coming knocking uh, and checking people's firearms. Like for anybody who's ever dealt with federal anything, like 90% of this stuff is an informant tipping off the police, right? And this goes to the same thing with uh, local law enforcement too. Like if you're a regular person, you should not let like um, a heavy handed BATFE and uh, New Jersey State Police um, a psyop you into not doing your constitutional duties. Like the number of times that red flag laws aren't even enforced in this uh, country is um, just, is like uh, in of itself kind of flies in the face of it. So, you know, carry, you know, carry lawfully um, and understand what you can do, understand the capabilities of your uh, weapons platform and train mm-hmm. with it periodically. And you'll probably never have to use it. And that's all I have. That's you crypto. Thanks Adam. Yeah. That, you know, that was very interesting. Um, I watched that video where, uh, you know, the, I think it was an agent, an agent came up and, you know, there were two behind him. So that, you know, they weren't, you know, so close or so encompassing, but it was, it was very interesting how, you know, he, you know, the agent said, you know, well, if you buy two or three guns at one time, you know, it sets off this alert and it comes to us. And then there was a question, cause we were talking about this in a space last week, Someone mentioned that, and and I didn't even think about it until the person brought up in the space. I think it was Greg actually who who may have brought it up. The agent said, "And weren't you pulled over?" And he named a state, like Minnesota or Michigan. Um, like, weren't you pulled over there with a firearm? And it was like a very weird question. It totally got past me, but it was a very well, it's weird a trap. question. Right, it's right. a trap question. So exactly. you're talking to a federal law enforcement officer, and if you say something that could be characterized as a lie, you've just committed a felony. Right. So. For folks, you have rights. Assert your rights. That doesn't right. mean that you can't necessarily be stepped on in terms of those rights, but you can assert them. That's what you can do. Do not talk to federal law enforcement in any official capacity without your lawyer present. If they want to come in your house, say no. Don't get into a fight with them. If they say they have a warrant and they're going to come in, you're not going to fight off 10, 12 armed federal agents, right. uh, but assert your rights. Make them come in. If they're going to come in, make them do it over your verbal rejection of their privilege to come in. Uh, that's all you can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that that is a... But for God's that, sakes, don't have casual conversations with, with federal law enforcement agencies who are, are there on duty. Right, exactly. We, you know, and it's they, funny because... They do it every day. Right. Because, yeah, because we were, you know, it, it just it's it's so funny that, you know, all the stuff we're talking about now and, you know, we get to hear it from you, Andrew. And, you know, people were asking, well, what if I say this or what if I say that? And I was saying, you know, listen, this isn't legal advice, but just don't talk to them. Just don't talk to them. Don't open your door. Tell them if anything, just tell them you want them to leave. I want my attorney. That's it. Please get off my just, property. I want my just attorney. shut your dirty little mouth. That's <laughs> right. all you need to do. <laughs> just, you right? know, and I don't you want just to go talk back to you. <laughs> right. Or you can just go back inside. There's these two guys yeah. who I, I have Enjoy to find the weather, them. gentlemen and shut the door. <laughs> exactly. There's these two guys I have to find. Um, they're, they're the pot brothers or something like that. And it's this, and there's these two brothers, they're criminal defense attorneys. They're always smoking either cigars or, or like a blunt. 
and they do these great commercials. I'll try to find one while we're talking here and put one in the nest. And essentially, and f- f- for everyone that's new here, part of my language, but um, there was one that someone sent me. I'll try to find it. It, it. It's super funny. They go, and if the cop says this or the cop, just shut the fuck up. And da, 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 just shut the fuck up. Shut your, it, it, you know, and they keep using this obscene language, but it really, it's funny. It drives the point home. It's the, it's, it, it's these two brothers and the brother says to the other brother. So if the cop pulls you over and they want to talk to you, or if the cop comes to your door and they want to talk to you, what do you say? You say nothing. Why? Cause you shut your fucking mouth. And they just have this really great commercial. And I think I, I want to say they're in Washington or or possibly Oregon, somewhere where weed is obviously recreationally legal because they're because they're smoking blunts during their commercials, um, which obviously those are those guys are more into the drug arrests, I think, than the firearms. But um, great commercials. I'm going to try to find one. Let me hop down to nuance for his reaction and then I'll, I'm going to head over to SD. Yeah, I wanted to respond to Paige, who I, I think is still in listener. But, you know, I yeah. would ask her, you know, if you're carrying in Texas, is it without a permit? Is it with a permit? Because that does make a big difference. I mean, you know, people think constitutional carry. Oh, I can just carry and I don't have to worry about it. You go into an H-E-B, you go into uh, a Bucky's, you know, a place that sells not even alcohol for consumption, but they're selling it for you like in bottles or whatever. So you can take home. Uh, read the sign. It says unpermitted carry. You can get a felony, uh, 10 years in prison, $10,000 fine. You know, mm-hmm. that's that's not a, something you want to run into. Always recommend getting the permit. Also keep in mind, it doesn't protect you from federal gun-free uh, school zone uh, laws. If you don't have the permit, if you do have the permit in your state, at the very least, it protects you against that. So just keep that stuff in mind. Read the laws um, and, you know, sign up for one of these, like, self-defense services uh you know i know uh andrew works with one you know some you can talk to these lawyers sometimes and uh get a sense of you know what you can and can't do so so just real quick before i go back to page uh things if you guys go to the top if you go to the far left they're called the pop brothers at law that's their website um so i put up one of their videos where the back brother is walking a blind it's just really funny Um, but however, if you go to them, they're out in California, actually. So I do apologize. They're in Stanton, California and, uh, they're pot brothers at law. Their actual website is pot brothers at law.com. Um, so there is a commercial I threw up there, uh, to the far left. So, so take a, take a look at that. It's definitely funny. Um, and, um, nuance you were talking about, man, something just ran out of my head, um, about firearms. It should come back at some point page, go back to you. Um, uh, have you gotten some, have you got some clarification to some of your thoughts? Yeah, I, um, so I'm a law enforcement kid. Everyone mm-hmm. in my family is law enforcement, but me, um, and I ha- I can still carry. And I was taught by a former Green Beret and now a former, uh, Harris County Sheriff's officer who retired when Lena Hidalgo changed the laws. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said, my life wasn't worth dying or going to prison for and there's a channel on youtube called active self-protection that he uses in his classes as examples okay wait so do you have a permit or or not you carry okay okay so that's good that that helps you out so before i go to sd um Andrew, let me let me get your take on this. Um, some states have it. Florida was un- unable to pass it again this year. Um, constitutional carry. Uh, what are your thoughts on that versus uh, concealed? Well, again, I should preface by saying my, my area of legal expertise is use of force law, not gun law. Sure, uh, sure. That that said, I consider myself a Second Amendment absolutist, by which I mean it's my opinion, professional and personal, that every single gun law, every one preemptively applied to law abiding, mentally sound American citizens is facially unconstitutional. Gotcha. Understood. Yeah. I and mean, by the way, I would also apply that to felons who served their sentence. Uh, in my world, when a felon is coming up for release, either there would be a determination that he is safe for society and he's mm-hmm. released and then he gets the civil rights back so he can be a functional member of society, or he's not safe to release, and then we don't let him out. 
Interesting. So let me yeah. let me throw let me toss one your way then, um, because I don't deal with clemency. But let me ask you about restoration of rights then. Um, obviously, well, in Florida, what the practice has been with Rick Scott and now DeSantis has been, um, which obviously we had the court battle and we've had some uh, case law and some some of the legislature that they're trying to pass. And, and now we're trying to figure out in the court system is when is, when is your sentence complete, right? Is it, is it complete when you get out of prison or, I mean, I've had people that I've gone to a jury trial on and they've been sentenced to 25 years as a mandatory minimum for trafficking in heroin with a $500,000 fine. So when they get out, they're never going to be able to pay that fine. And we can go down to trafficking in heroin, um, or fentanyl for four to 14 grams, which is going to be a three or five year. And that's going to give you a $50,000 fine. So do, so two questions for you is, do you differentiate personally between a, a nonviolent crime and a violent crime? So should the, should the trafficker in heroin, which is our, well, I, I don't think there should be any loss of civil rights for a nonviolent crime. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so so if the person goes to prison for home invasion, discharging a firearm, well, that's spends, a violent crime, right? Correct, correct, right, okay. right, right. Does does the twenty five years because they shot someone when they come back out on the twenty five min man, which actually is the only time in Florida you have to do day for day is is when you is, sure the mandatory is, minimums, right? Right, is when the firearms involved. You're saying it's your personal opinion that person should get his should be able to get a gun then. Yes. For okay. one thing, I don't think you can keep him from getting a gun anyway. Yeah, I share. I, well, I mean, it's though, definitely I done. Share, I share his opinion deeply. No, no. And that's fine. But I'm saying so I, th I think the rule is pointless. And if it's pointless, why have it as a constraint on people's civil rights? I mean, I'm mm -hmm. comfortable with people having their civil rights constrained to the extent that they were given due process on that mm -hmm. constraint. So if they go to trial and they're found guilty and they're sentenced to 25 years, you can restrain their civil rights for 25 years. If they're released at 15 years, you can still have 10 years of restraint on their civil rights. But whenever they've served the full sentence, their rights ought to be back. And I, I'm not a fan of tagging on these things that follow them forever that were never part of the actual due process of the trial. So let me ask you the one follow-up because you didn't name it, and I think you may have alluded to it. Um, when you when you violate or if you traffic in heroin, you get that massive fine that comes with it. So when you get out of prison, that fine obviously is going to follow you because you haven't made any money in prison, and not many people can make a thousand to repay that fine. So there's current lawsuits going on saying, have you actually completed your sentence or not? What what what's your personal take on that? You know, the money aspect, I'll leave to the uh, the legal academics and philosophers to discuss. Okay. I'm, I'm mostly concerned about people's civil rights and, and the sentences they have to serve. It's why I do criminal law, not civil law. Sure. The, the money stuff just isn't that important to me in the greater scheme of things. Gotcha. I'm, I'm definitely no expert, but I take a shot at it. Uh, yeah, no, no. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, Mark, as you know, down here, we're having the court battles right now of yes. whether or not. Um, and there are people that are doing, you know, fundraising for certain people to pay off the fines. But, you know, there's a bunch of lawsuits going that, that people are saying, well, you haven't completed your sentence right, because right. as when you were adjudicated, you were said by the court to, you know, to pay this fine. Um, you know, and obviously they're massive. And, and, and you know, even when even when I I can't think yeah. of maybe but one or two cases where they've been concurrent, even when they're I'm sorry. Sorry, consecutive, even concurrent, the fines in, 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 in different counts, they still, they still add up. So it's, so if you have yeah. one, so if one is fentanyl, one's heroin, one is morphine, um, you know, you could have, uh, over a million dollars in fines, right? Yeah. So I, I don't know, I don't know for sure, but just my, I guess, reaction to it is I think about suspending someone's rights while they're in prison. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm completely, I'm completely with Andrew, which is I want society to, uh, to kind of determine the norms, you know, with uh, weapon possession and such, because if these guys are so dangerous, they should be locked up. If you think that, you know, they're good enough for society to be out, 
then they should be good enough in society to have their rights restored. So the money part, to answer your question, well, the money part, let I make wonder. A, let me make a quick comment on that, Mark. The, yeah. so, but not all cases are tried equally. So there have been some really bad people that I only have a borderline iffy case on them because the video was bad. It was in a bathroom. Sure, it it was dark. Yeah. So, right. So what happens is if the video was better, the guy goes away for 25 years. But instead, yeah. maybe we plead to a possession with intent or possession to distribute instead. And he goes on 24 months probation instead. Well, he's some, still he's still the bad quote same bad person. It's right. just my it's just my evidence was weaker in the case. Yeah, but the the problem is we're still relying heavily on the criminal justice process to prevent crime. We're still pre you know preventing crimes against people because we're, we're talking about using guns, right? So that's what we're talking about. So again, it's this idea that we're going to legislate our way out of criminal violent gun behavior and we're not right and then the same thing can be said with the guy that got 25 30 or 50 years or whatever he got if he had a better attorney if he had if some better motions were filed if a better argument was made right a better objection then he might have gotten less so you know i you know but I, i'll go back to just just the money thing which is i maybe my take is completely wrong but my reaction is i think about indentured servitude OK, I think fines are lawful. I think fines should be imposed. But I don't know if the fine itself, uh, your ability or your, you know, your rate at which you can afford to pay it back and pay your restitution. I don't know if that should affect your rights. Right. Yeah, no, that's fair. And a lot of times what Rick Scott and DeSantis have been doing in Florida is, you know, you get back pretty much all of your rights, but you do not get back the right to own a firearm, which is which is what I've seen, at least um, on my end. Let me bounce a nuance for a reaction that I'm going to then I'm going to go to Greg nuance. Go ahead, buddy. Yeah, I mean, the thing I fear the most with, you know, the felons losing their gun rights is it could be backdoor gun control for just all law abiding citizens. So you could have a situation where they're like, well, we'll make a crime that's like super, you know, anyone can do it, but we won't really, you know, it'll almost be like we won't give you the prison time, even though felonies, it's like <clears throat> one year or whatever. But sometimes it could be a fine. Yeah, they'll just make violence, it nuance. super domestic yeah, they'll, violence. Yeah, they'll, they'll make it. I mean, yeah, they already do with a misdemeanor domestic violence, but. You know, they'll they'll keep pushing, pushing it and they'll try to expand it to just law abiding citizens who get a ticket or something, call that a felony and say, well, it's a felony. So we're going to take away your gun rights. Uh, I, I don't like that. I, I think when you I mean, it, it, does anyone think there's a reason why Martha Stewart shouldn't be privileged to possess a gun? <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> but, I mean, but she's I, not. Yeah, it's, it's punitive. Yeah. It's not preventative. It's just punitive. Yeah, so I just don't want to give the government more tools. Like, if someone's truly dangerous enough to where they can't own a gun, keep them in prison. Like, just do that. Yeah, but the problem is, at some point, their sentence is up, right? And I've done enough cases where there's, you know, there's some really bad guys. And, you know, and Liberty, I'll bring you up right now. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of bad guys, you know, we've done an operation for six or nine months on a drug trafficking organization. Some flip, some get less time. Some, you just don't have the evidence on, but you know, they're violent people. And, you know, maybe you only can get a plea for 24 months. Um, but you know, one of they're the, getting the guns anyway, and, <laughs> but they're, and they're more of an incentive to you, to you actually like prosecuting them and charging them as much as possible and not being super lenient. There's a reason the word no. liberty is spelled different than the word safety. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. The world but, is dangerous, guys. The world right, but, is dangerous. Right. But I guess I could say in the name of safety and or liberty, what we do is we'll often plea the person down to a much lesser charge, whether this is state or federal court, because um, I've been in both. We'll, we'll plead the person down to a much lesser charge with minimal even jail time just to get that felony adjudication, just to get guns off of him. A lot so he of can't walk in and buy them. Laziness. Like they, they do it out of laziness a lot of times. Oh, well, I, no, I'm just saying when I've done it, it's because my case sucks. I think so. So, so crypto, so, so, crypto, so, are you sorry. admitting to prosecuting the man and not necessarily the crime? No, I'm prosecuting the crime, sure. but the evidence I have with it. So I mean, if this I, is my bias as a criminal defense attorney, but if your sure. evidence sucks, that sounds like a you problem. That not is a civil right. rights problem. <laughs> right, right, right. But that is a big <laughs> problem, but I'm still going to get a felony conviction.
unless it sucks so bad, I'm going down to a misdemeanor charge. I, I just I'm missing the point where, you know, where we have criminal justice process. We're asking that to prevent future crimes and future ill will of bad people who do bad things. You know, well, I, oh, 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 hold on, guys. Doesn't doesn't it make sense that a drug trafficker who has firearms and guns in the house, which is already a crime to start with, who's violent is, doesn't it make sense to keep guns out of his hands to the most extent possible? So what am I victim on those crimes? Yeah, keep them in prison. Yeah, right, right, right. Him on those crimes. Run those right, 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 but right, but <laughs> right, but Andrew's coming. They'll from never a criminal, get out. Right, but Andrew's coming from a criminal defense world, and Mark and Nuance are coming from fantasy lands where <laughs> I where I cannot convict someone for twenty five years on every single crime just because the evidence I have is sometimes the evidence. They, they I literally have. don't deport these people when they're illegal immigrants that commit Crypto, these crimes in these sanctuary cities. I crimes mean, they haven't committed. Enforce the law. Right. So I think Adam, okay, so I'll go to Adam here, but <laughs> I think, I think what, what you're missing is just the way Andrew said, you, you're given the jury that you get, or you're given the grand jury and they have discretion. I also can't make up evidence. So there are some cases where I get great body camera. I get great CI footage. I get great UC footage. There are other cases where, as Andrew said, it's a me problem. I have really shitty footage. So I'm going to do the best of my ability to still convict this dangerous person, but I can't get what I would normally get because, you know, either, either the hat was on sideways or or the pen was going the wrong way or it wasn't uploaded to the cloud. There's 84 reasons why I get shitty videos from my agent, right? But no what case, I'm saying- no Right. No face, no case. So it's difficult when I have those. But what I'm saying is sometimes you have to prosecute with what you get. You don't always have the best evidence. Adam, hey, Crypto, can I ask a quick question? Let me go to Adam real quick. Then I'll come to you, Michael. Yeah, I apologize, Adam and Desiree. No problem. Adam, go ahead, buddy. No worries. Uh, no worries. Um, you know, so that's why you need the Facebook app like they had on the other guys, right? Because then uh, you can get the get their uh, face from the back of their head. But, you know, I, th- I think... Uh, like I think this is something crypto is like underselling is the uh, the aspect of what are the crimes that he kind of mentioned here, which are they tend to be organized crime, right? And I think this is one of the aspects of it is that you know when you talk about stopping crime and bringing justice, like it, these things are um, these ten- things tend to be beyond the individual oftentimes, and uh, that's why but the role of the also- prosecutor is not supposed to be to stop crime. Well, it, 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 but it functionally is. I mean, that's the reality. Like, well, I, mean, that, that's, I, that, I hate, I hate to be a mistake. the bearer of bad news for you, um, but like, you know, there's somebody who has to like be uh, actively pursuing, you know, organizations. That's why it's not working. Now, by which, it? what's that? That's why it's not working. What do you mean? Like, it's not. It's not. What, the what's not working? Well, that's why you mean? prosecutor the, the system you're talking about is fighting crime for you know it, preventing future future acts. It's not working. You're still going to have. Oh no, that. it's. It's it's uh like it's per, it's fighting like what's I'm using the organized crime case here. It's fighting the current crime, right? Which is organized crime, which is a myriad of other, uh, layered criminal activities, such that you uh, you have people uh, engage with various degrees of violent and nonviolent crime in a uh, in a manner which people specialize in certain tasks, and that's kind of the very purpose of. Um, being able to have a prosecutorial uh, discretion, for lack of a better term. I'm not a lawyer. I only um, read a lot about this stuff. And, you know, it does fall upon, um, you know, the prosecutors, falls upon law enforcement to take these things into consideration. Now, I agree with the ideal state that is the fact that, like, um, we should, you know, be minimally prosecuting people and we should be prosecuting people for the crimes that they commit. But you only can prosecute what you can prosecute. And there's still bad people out there who are intent on doing bad things. I, I would suggest um, that it's 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 bad public policy to say that prosecutors ought to be able to do things to people absent evidence necessary to prove them guilty beyond a reasonable doubt because it's a good idea. Well, that's not due process of law. Well, I'm not saying that they shouldn't be doing that. I'm saying that they should uh, uh, they should be able to um, pr- prosecute people for the crimes that they can prove in court. Right. And that's all. 
Right, right. And, right. and that's all we but can do. But if you do. can't prove it in court beyond a reasonable doubt and the bad guy goes free, guess what? That's part of the system. The system is designed to allow for bad people to get away with things. And Andrew, where am I saying that uh, that you should be uh, double jeopardying or like extrajudiciously, extrajudicially pursuing criminals? I'm saying I, that- I, I hear things like we're 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 getting uh, charges or convictions against people to stop crime. That's not a yeah. prosecutor's job to stop crime. It, I mean, it's the de facto reality, though. Oh, okay. I mean, they, it's they, true. They, they, I mean, like, where, where's the lie? Like, the I'm, not, not working, I'm not trying Adam. to be a, I, I'm not trying to be a dick if, about If this. that's what they're doing, they're doing something beyond their job. Their job is to seek justice, which is to prove people guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of the crimes with which they're charged within the constraints of due process of law. It's not to be. It's not to wear a cape and stop crime. Okay, but like what? So, what's using my organized crime example? What's your opinion on racketeering as a uh, as a criminal prosecutorial? Tool? Racketeering, there, there are statutes against racketeering. Get the evidence beyond of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt and convict that person. I have listen. I'm a criminal defense attorney. I have no qualms about my clients going to prison if they're convicted, proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. That's just the way it is. But until you do that, you can't put my client in prison. Right. right. I mean, I, I don't think Adam and maybe I'm hearing something different. So I'll go to Mark next. Um, but I don't think Adam's saying that what, what I'm gathering from Adam or at least let me think what I've so gathered all, from Adam. Everything I described is a prosecutor proving guilt on a crime that's already occurred. Correct. He's not stopping something. N- no, what I'm saying. And, and, I, and I and I don't know if this is this is this is this could just be what I've gathered from Adam, which is totally off base. I don't know. What I'm saying is, yes, whatever whatever indictment is in front of me or whatever information I filed is going to be the charge that I'm going to prosecute that I feel is the one that I can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, obviously, if I only have four to 14 grams, I can't charge someone with trafficking in more than that weight, right? So it's 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 and because I only really did organize crime for, you know, seven, eight years after doing major crimes, this is what I'm really familiar with. So I, but, but what I can say is, and, and when, that's all true. Even if you know, he habitually has a hundred grams on him. Right. Of course. Right. Of, right you can only course. work with the evidence. Of course. You, you only got, you only got what you can got. And when you go into the house and you, you do a search warrant and you find seven bricks, but you can't put it on someone because it's all constructive possession to everyone. Well, you're kind of fucked, right? Because there's 12 people in the house and how do you put it on someone, right? So you don't charge all 12 people. That's just not practical. You, you would never get a guilty conviction out of that. So it's who talks, who flips, where's the DNA, where's prints. A lot of things come into play. But I think – and I could be totally wrong on this, Adam. Obviously – when I did this job, you only prosecuted the crime you had on you at that time, not stuff you missed or things like that. But when you send someone to prison, you are stopping that person from committing crime in the future. I don't know if that is what Adam was saying or not. And and you're disrupting the criminal network, right? That's that's also the uh, very important thing. You're, that, uh, well, that's what we try ideally, to do. I mean, the reality is prisons are uh, run by criminals, like not the, necessarily all the prison guards, but you know what I mean. Like that's yeah. a whole different conversation, but well, right. that's what they have civil asset forfeiture laws for, right? And the feds, the feds are very much into the civil asset forfeitures more so than the states. And to be quite honest, the drug trafficking organizations these days, or you know, they just tend to be very, very, um, they're not what you think of when you think of you know actual DTOs. Like when you think of you know, like they're just they're just so um, unorganized that to even put them, you know, to, to, you know, to actually have a criminal enterprise, you know, to meet that under the, under the statute is actually sometimes difficult because they're so unorganized, but um, yeah, so definitely good conversation. Uh, Michael, um, I'll hop up to you and then I'll, and then I'll bounce around alpha. I'll bring you up. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I'll try to make it quick. My first question, uh, crypto is when you talked about potentially kind of lowering charges or making a deal or whatever, um, was that sometimes in relevant to like what you said earlier about kind of getting a read for the jury? Um, you know what I mean? Like you see the case, you see the jury, whatever, and you may not be able to get them on the higher crime or whatever. So then possibly making a deal 
that they're going to accept that is acceptable to you. So I don't see a jury. So what happens is most likely right. what would happen is we go into, we do a search warrant, we come out or we do a couple buys and the video suck. And at this point, my boss says, Hey, listen, let's just indict him. Let's be done with it. And then what I'm saying is the evidence I have is the evidence I have. So, right. so you're, my, my understanding, I mean, I could right. be wrong. Correct me if I am, but mm -hmm. you're, the deals are being made long before juries. Oh, some of my deals, if they're, if I have a shitty case and I, and I, even if I don't want to flip the guy, but if I have a shitty case, meaning the videos are bad, my deal can be done within 30 days of arrest. Right. So by the time a jury selected, that's, that's what you're going with. You're going with whatever you have on the table at that point. Right, right, right. So if I have, so obviously I want to try my good ones, right? I want to try my good ones and hopefully higher charge ones and my shitty ones, which is, you know, what comes to mind is a is an agent that kept doing a bunch of Snapchats with this guy buying these fentanyl pills. We were buying a lot of them. It was always in a McDonald's bathroom. The guy would turn off the lights when he walked in there. He was black. You couldn't see him. We, you know. So when I got all this, we were just like, listen, cut the cord. It's the fourth time we've done it. He keeps doing it. We're never going to fucking see his face. Just be done and do it. On that, I had shitty evidence. I had a shitty case and. I, you know, I think I probably applied him to possession, even though we had a bunch of sales. So, you know, we, you know, you, from a prosecutor standpoint, you want to get rid of that case as soon as possible. And I would assume Andrew, from your standpoint, you want to make the best deal for your client as possible. No, we have shitty evidence. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, my, right. you know, my job, I don't think of it in terms of the particular client. I think of it in terms of holding the state to their burden to prove sure. whatever sure. client it is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And if I don't think you can do that, well, of course, I'm going to advocate vigorously for my client, naturally. Right. But don't. Right. But some of those, even though we have crappy videos, there are people that will do one of two things, right? They'll either roll the dice and go to trial and they could win. They could. The jury, you know, in your closing, you would say, listen. Oh, no, I don't. I don't want my client going to trial unless I absolutely have to. I mean, uh, well, uh, well, I mean, is well, I mean, isn't there really two options there? One option is take it to trial because we have crappy evidence or two, take my lower, 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 lower plea offer, but it may make him a felon being possession of heroin. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, listen, in, in, as a practical matter, in my experience, most of these mm -hmm. people looking at that question of whether to take a felony plea are already felons. True. So, That's true. That's true. I mean, yeah, you know, no, it's, it's more icing on the cake, I guess. Yeah, but it, yeah, I mean, it's not just, a life changing event for them. Right. They just come in, they plea. And if you happen to catch them six months later, you got them higher on the score. They're going to have the same gun the next time you catch them as they did the right. last time you caught them. I mean, right. Yeah, no, no, that's true. I mean, and it's the ones, though, you make a good point. It really is the ones that are either young, which is unfortunate, or the ones that have just been under the radar which it's their first felony conviction. So becoming a felon is a massive deal to them. Those are the ones that will often, you know, roll the dice at trial because sometimes it is for them. And sometimes they're not, there's, there's a huge cultural component here. I mean, for a lot of these mm -hmm. people, everybody they know is a convicted felon, right? Everybody went through the, it's, it's like graduating high school. <laughs> right. Right. No, it's, it's, it's sad. But when you look a lot, of, when, when you look a lot, when you look at a lot of these DTOs, you know, it's like, you know, well, who's your supplier? And it turns out to be the uncle down the road. Right. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost uh, half the family are convicted felons. I mean, right. it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, yeah. it's a different, it's, it's just a different lived experience than, than most of the people I'm sure who are listening to this have, have been through. Correct. Yeah. Just, hey, Crypto, so just real quick comment. Um, Good, Michael. Go ahead, buddy. Law, Good. Yeah, thank you, guys. Law and self-defense. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. What was your name, sir? Andrew. Andrew, I'm so sorry. I really, no really worries. enjoy the, the conversation between you and Crypto. I just have to say that. But I think what, what you've stated, and this is just kind of who I am, and I think, I don't know if it was Thomas Jefferson. I forget which one, but there well, there's an old statement that kind of plays to the foundation of our legal system, which... I think the quote goes something like a better that a hundred people go, uh, you know, free than one innocent or one innocent person be found guilty or whatever the, the quote was. And I think that's what you were kind of referring to, which, you know, I think is a very solid, uh, you know, belief of our, our legal system, if you will.
Yeah, I mean, my view is uh, the purpose of the criminal justice system ought not to be to put bad people in jail. It ought to be to put bad people in jail who have been proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm. That's a different Venn diagram. Right. Yeah. Agreed. Um, Michael, any follow-up before I bounce around? No, sir. Appreciate the conversation. Okay, no problem. I'm going to head over to uh, Mira and then Alpha and then Liberty. I brought you up. Um, and I also brought up um, Savage. If if you guys would like to speak, just toss your hands up for me, please. Um, the way you do it is you hit the heart in the bottom right. Once you hit the heart, a bunch of things will come up, bunch of, a bunch of emojis. There you go. Perfect. Hit the far right hand and toss that up for me. Um, Savage, I'm just going to mute your mic. So I'm getting feedback. So Liberty, um, if you could do that. Oh, I'm so sorry, SD. I'm so sorry. I, um, let me hop to SD first and then, and then I'm going to Mira SD. I lost you and you're back now. So go ahead, sir. Hey, yeah, that's not your fault. Crypto. That's fine. Uh, I'm sorry, buddy. Go ahead. Um, are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I just had pages from a while ago, uh, regardless of your size, uh, you should not be scared to carry your gun. If you're scared to carry your gun, you probably shouldn't, regardless of your training. Um, I'm a bigger guy. I'm over 6'4". Uh, I carry my gun every way. Uh, I've seen people as small as 4'8 carry guns. Um, I work in a city that's one of the most deadly cities in the United States right now. Um, you just need to do your homework. Uh, I don't quote this uh, instructor often. Um, <clears throat> often. But Dennis Benigno is uh, the owner and operator of Street Cop Training. And today I watched one of his memoirs, and he said it's your job as a police officer and or a citizen to know your rights and know when you when you can or can't carry a gun. Um, so that's really all I have to say is it doesn't matter how tall you are. I know tall or small. I know a bunch of people are mentioning, well, I'm this, this height, this, that small. It doesn't matter about your your height, your size, your gender, anything about that. Um, you just need to feel comfortable. Thanks. Right. Thanks, SD. I appreciate it, brother. Good to see you tonight. Um, Andrew, I have a question for you. Someone who wrote to me, and then I'm going to go over uh, to Mira. Um, so this is a G6 question, um, which we've covered here in our spaces. So over in D.C., um, I think it's at Main Justice over there. Um, but J, so J6ers are being held pre-trial. I think we all know that a lot of them are being held um, without bond. But those who are charged, and I'm just reading from a person here. Um, so someone um, knows of someone who's been charged with a misdemeanor petty offense of, I believe, trespassing. It's a nonviolent crime. And um, their pre-trial conditions, which, you know, as I know, is this is quite normal, is to remove all weapons, firearms, drugs, being drug tested, all that stuff. Um, given our conversation earlier um, of, 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 come of some of the moralities that we've spoken with, I know that they can do this. Um, this person wants your take on having weapons and ammunition taken away when you're charged with a misdemeanor such as trespassing. Well, I mean, I think it's ridiculous, but unfortunately, mm -hmm. the, the uh, for better or for worse, the courts have a great deal of discretion on, listen, you can right. stay in jail right. if you want, uh, but if you want to be released, it's under their conditions and they can set pretty much whatever the conditions they want. And that's just the way that works. And for most judges, one of the first conditions they'll set is they'll take your guns away. That's, right. that's just how they do it. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what else to say about that. Uh, in terms yeah. of the January 6th, uh, you know, unfortunate folks being persecuted by today's government. Uh, right. That's that's not really a use of force question. That's a political question, but I think it's reprehensible. But when you put bad people in charge of your government, this mm -hmm. is the kind of thing that happens. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I could not have said it better. Um, absolutely. I think absolutely on point. Um, before I go to Mira, Mark, uh, what's your take on that? Um, you know, obviously a lot of nonviolent uh, petty, whether it's picketing parading i didn't i mean i didn't even know we had picketing in parading i never even saw that when i was charging anyone what's your take mark on um some of the conditions on pretrial because obviously on pretrial you, you know you, you haven't you haven't been found guilty yet yeah it's 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 tough uh i would say uh generally i i fall on 
uh, just purely innocent until proven guilty. I think that, you know, like I said, I can say this all the time, the world's dangerous, right? And the idea that we're going to just uh, use the criminal justice process to prevent uh, people in possession, people in use of guns. Uh, you know, you look at all the gun laws that are out there now and, and you know, there's still mm-hmm. unlawful possession. There's still, you know, prohibited weapons. There's still sure. unlawful usage. So I, I, you know, I generally think that we at this current time and place in American history, we like to think that we can uh, sort of just sort of use the criminal justice process to prevent bad use of guns. And I, and I just think I'm just wondering when we're going to wake up and realize it's, it's, it's ineffective. So to yeah. fall on it, I would say, no, no. You know, if, if they have guns and they're pre-trial, they have guns and they're pre-trial. I mean, my, my view would be to treat it much like I suggest we ought to treat felons who've served their sentence. Once they're released, mm-hmm. either they're not safe enough to release and you keep them or they're safe enough to release and they get their civil rights back. I think someone who's been charged, either they're too dangerous to be in the community and you keep them locked up pending trial, mm-hmm. or they can be safely released into the community. And then these gun restrictions are nonsense because right. I've never met a bad actor in my life who couldn't get his hands on a gun within 24 hours of wanting one. Right. Yeah. I was about to say to Mark, I think if you treat the, I guess if you want to call it a war on guns, if you're going to, if you're going to treat that the way we've been doing the war on drugs, well, Everyone in the space tonight, no matter how inept or no matter how high class, low class, where you live, if your life depended on it, you could find crack cocaine or, or heroin tonight. You could right. do it. Yeah. You I've could. never met a drug addict in my life who didn't right. know where to buy their drugs. Right. Yeah. So I wouldn't have the first clue in South Florida. I could find it by midnight tonight. Trust me. And I, that's only... That's only two hours and 10 minutes. I could find it if I was depended on it. More so, <laughs> more than enough time. So, if we're going to treat it the way we treat the war on drugs, uh, it's not going to be a great outcome. So, uh, let me head over to, and Andrew, thank you so much. Just let me know either by DM or just let me know because I know, uh, you know, time is. Time is valuable for you here. Yeah, so I, I am I am starting to run out of time. So if there's questions okay. specific to me, I would prioritize those while you have me. Otherwise, just continue as you're going. Awesome. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go to here's here's what I have right now. Um, I have Mira, Alpha, Liberty, Savage, and Steven. I'm going to go to each person. If you guys have a specific question to do with firearms and self defense, well, now, just use the force law for me. I don't do gun laws. Okay, so, sorry. Yeah. So. Use of force. So if you have a question about use of force, now is the time. Um, if you don't, that's fine. I'll come back to you and we'll continue on. But if you have use of force, now's the time for Andrew. Um, otherwise, uh, he needs to go after that. And then we'll continue on with our conversation. So if you don't have use of force, that's okay. Just let me know and I'll come back to you. Mira, you're up first. Should we ask him about the Houston thing? I- oh, I- I'll, yeah. Yeah, let me go to him. Yeah, that's... Nuance, that's a great point. We can get his take on that. Mira, go ahead. I don't have a use of force uh, crypto, but uh, okay. crypto heart, but I do have a, um, a human aspect that I wanted to present to the defense attorney. Um, I lost my the, the the system is broken uh, as far as the the drug uh, defend, uh, the drug pipeline. Mm-hmm. Um, I lost my 18 year old son and, uh, you know, we are upper middle class family and the, the individuals that were running the drugs in the County, uh, never saw a jail. The, uh, law enforcement uh, individuals, there were, uh, there was, uh, some uh, sh- um, individuals within the law enforcement um, com- community that were dirty. And now, several years later, we find out that one of the judges is doing time in the state penitentiary. Um, and it was just a broken system. So my son is dead. Uh, and Nobody ever saw a prison. And yeah, I'm sorry about that, Mira. Not uncommon to people across the country. And you see the pipeline coming in, coming in, coming in. And we have no accountability. And 
I know that you have a job to do, but when you are a parent and you're sitting across from law enforcement and a coroner who is not even a medical doctor, you know, and, and uh, Mark and Crypto, I know I've been a nurse for 30 years. I served overseas and you have two people, one in the sheriff's department and one who is a coroner. As I said, he's not a medical doctor that's telling you that there's nothing that they can do. The frustration just builds up and everybody in the county knows who the drug suppliers are and that their hands are tied. You know, you just you just want to go out and get your gun and take matters into your own hands, but you can't. Right. And yeah, and Mira. you individuals are there uh, on retainer for these folks. It just it's just so frustrating. And right. the kids well, keep dying, Mira. keep dying, and keep dying. Yeah, Mira Hoppin, uh, um, I'm I'm definitely going to. I'm definitely going to come back to you. And I know, I, I know, I, know have, I understand that they have specific questions, but no, 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 you know, that's okay. I'm this right. There's a, there's a, yeah, there is a um, human side to all of this. Right. And, and I'm sure that Andrew is aware of it. And, you know, you know, we have obviously a drug problem, you know, we have the cartel area, which is, which is, you know, a tough area to control. We have the Bahamian area, Caribbean, you know, the Caribbean area, which is hard to control. And, um, and then, of course, every defendant, you know, if if they're even if if they're even arrested for probable cause and to prove their case, you know, every defendant has their rights under the Constitution. So um, before I go to Alpha, Andrew, let me ask you a quick question. Um, it's up in the nest. I also DM'd it to you. It's a 21 second clip that's up in the nest that everyone can look at. It, it's going to be. Um, um, let me take things out of the nest. Guys, do me a favor. Please don't toss things into the nest because it makes it much more difficult to find things. Andrew, if you could look up top or in, in your DMs, um, there is a 21 second clip from the daily Sneed, and there's a video there. If you click on it, it'll, it'll open up on your phone or if you're on your computer, you can see it there as well. Um, where there is, it's in Houston and there's a car that looks like, <laughs> looks like road rage. Can you see the video? Yeah, well, I mean, this is classic Houston, right? So, <laughs> right. So, go ahead, go ahead. Just, just you know. But I mean, just, the, the legal question is always the same, folks. When we're talking mm-hmm. about whether or not a use of deadly force was justified, and I, I presume from the video, I don't have the audio on, but I presume she's still firing at the car as it's clearly uh, driving away. Uh, yeah. The question is, uh, at the moment she fired each of those shots, or each subject to their own analysis, at the moment she was firing those shots, was she facing an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury? Um, right. now, and, uh, might, and, uh, might there be some justification even on this footage? Could those people in the car, for example, have been pointing guns at her? Maybe. Right. Uh, I don't see that. Uh, but that's the evidence that you would need to see to do that legal analysis. Is there evidence pro or, or con on whether in the moment she fired the shot, she was facing an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury? That's what needs to be present. Uh, mm-hmm. For her to be justified in that use of deadly force, unless we're talking some other wacky scenario, I don't know, kidnapping or something bizarre happening. Sure. Even then, I don't really see the justification. But that's the core question: Was she facing an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury when she fired those shots? And that's hard to justify when you're firing at a car that's driving away. Right at the one second marker, you can see the car is making a left turn to get around her. She fires then, and then when and then when it makes that right turn, she then just kind of brings it up with the one arm and fires right. again. Well, when, when the car is in close proximity, it's it's a more ambiguous question, right? Because the right. car itself could be used as a weapon. There could Correct. be people in the car pointing weapons at close proximity. It's 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 more ambiguous. So it's, it's like the Michael Dunn case in Florida, right? You're probably mm-hmm. familiar with that yes. one, yes. Uh, where he, he, he fired into uh, this SUV with four young black men in it. Uh, right. While they were next to him uh, and actually got a hung hung jury on the charges related to that firing. But then he continued firing at the SUV as it drove away and got convicted on those uh, right. charges. Because by the time the SUV was driving away and he was still shooting at it, it was no longer any reasonable eminent threat to him. Well, it's also a right. bit different because this is Texas. So if there was a robbery in progress, for example, like that could change. It's not a progress. When the, OK, no, I mean, it. Could, I mean, there's they're getting away with your things. It's still in progress. Oh, you mean uh, yeah for defense of personal property? Yeah, 
Yeah, so uniquely under Texas law. But again, you have to look very carefully at that statute. A lot of the, because you can, there are circumstances in Texas law under statute 9.42, penal code 9.42, where you can use force in defense of property if you reasonably believe there's no other way to recover the property. That could be the case here. Uh, but again, that's that would be a uniquely Texas analysis. Right. All right, guys, we're going to do it real quick. Um, again, use of force. Um, if you have one, uh, please fire it out. Otherwise, we're going to um, move on. We're, um, if you have any other questions about like J6 or the justice system or the fact that it works or it doesn't work, save that for after. Um, right now, we're just because I know that Andrew has to go. So just let's talk about use of force because that's what he's here for. And Oh, by the way, before we move on for this yes. thing, even if he had some kind of justification based on defensive property under 9.42, I wouldn't be at all surprised if she ended up facing a felony reckless endangerment charge. I agree. Uh, sending those, yeah. That, that, yeah. that round wasn't even uh, well aimed. She I, had. I think it was, think she it was had, probably about 70 feet off to the left and up. But yeah. 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 She's just firing in the general direction. I mean, there's there's a, there's a dealership back there. There's even a building. That, even there's that's people there. Right. <laughs> Is there a she, PMS enhancement? <laughs> she she had uh she had reckless indifference on that one we'll just yeah. go with that she, she should really just say it was a negligent discharge at that point because it's oh, so God. ridiculous um let me go over to alpha alpha do you have a question for use of force well it, it wouldn't be a question of, it might fall under a question of uh of force i had from where he was uh andrew i think's your name uh yes Lord, yes sir uh, and, and this goes to you too, Crypto, because I want your sure. point of view on this. Sure. Um, earlier when you were speaking about we're prosecuting and everything, mm -hmm. I was wondering about your take on with all the evidence and everything that has come out um, with Hunter and everything. Yeah. yeah. How, how do you guys stand on that as far as being like a prosecutor or an ex-prosecutor? You know, um why is nobody moving in on that? Because I <laughs> because mean, they don't want to. Right, right. They don't want to. So right. again, you have to do the kind of a legal analysis, which I haven't done in Hunter's case. I haven't looked at his laptop stuff. It's just, that's not my area of expertise. But let's presume he's easily convicted on the legal merits. Then you need a human being who, in authority, who wants to do that. And they mm -hmm. don't want to do it. Right. Yep. His, you know, his dad's president. Um, you know, a lot of things... A lot, a lot of things going on with that guy. Um, a lot of things on that computer. I know that 4chan hacked it. Um, you know, I always tell everyone, be careful when you go over there. If it's live, I don't know. I've never been there, but be careful what you click on because it would be super ironic yet super bad for you if you clicked on Hunter's child porn and you got arrested for having child porn on your computer, but Hunter Biden didn't. Yeah. So, so guess yeah, what? It's, it's, not, it's not a defense that they didn't prosecute Hunter Biden. <laughs> exactly. So, do not start clicking on links over there. Please don't do that. Um, let me hop over to um, Savage, uh, Savage, and then I'll go up to uh, uh, Stephen uh, for use of force, and then Andrew is going to have to take off, and hopefully we can get him back sometime either here or the podcast. So, Andrew, um, in advance now, just real quick, thank you so much for spending uh, two hours with us right now. You know, sure. we've, we've, we've absolutely appreciated it. It's, it, it. it's been a pleasure. So let me go to Savage, and then I'll go to Steve. Savage, go ahead, buddy. Hey, how's it going? How are you, sir? Doing good. So I've got a use of force question. Uh, awesome. <laughs> where, I, where I live, I live in Tennessee. Yep. We have a lot of, uh, I live in a really rural area. We have a lot of, we have a drug problem. Yep. Cue all the Tennessee jokes, the hillbilly jokes or whatever, but. <clears throat> it's, the problem's everywhere, man. And, uh, you know, occasionally you will have people, I mean, be out in your yard. It's happened several times. They'll just come up to you and say, hey, you know, I need your money. Not a, hey, do you have any money? Hey, and it's like a, hey, you know, get the hell off my property kind of deal. And they have threatened people with physical harm or even just say, hey, I'm going to kill you. Give me your money. They're not brandishing a weapon. You don't know that. I don't know that, right? At what point would you be legally justified to use lethal and deadly force? Because some people have gotten violent and people have, uh, some people are kind of scared to, Shoot, because I'm in a county that it's rural, but part of the county is city, and everybody's moving. Yeah, right. The city. So where is your jury actually going to come from? I mean, that yes, that's the thing because we've got a uh, we've got a really critical DA race going on, 
Yeah. And it's literally you you go left. I mean, you use a buck a double lot buckshot to defend yourself in your house. You're you're probably going to jail. And the other person, the other person running for DA, uh, she's, you know, pro two A. She's like, look, if you if someone breaks into your home or someone's threatening you and your life, your family, you're gonna save us paperwork. So what I would suggest the view people take on this is, first of all, if you're talking about defending your home against a forcible, unlawful intruder into your home, it's almost impossible for you to screw that up from a legal self-defense perspective. The, the law gives you everything you need to justify that shooting. And that said, people do screw it up. You chase that guy out of your house and down the street and shoot him in the street, that's not going to look like a defensive dwelling um, scenario anymore. Uh, but if you're shooting someone who's breaking into your home, it's really difficult for you to screw that up. Uh, in terms of just shooting someone in self-defense, people need to think about this realistically. And do you, at that moment, do you genuinely believe you're in imminent fear of deadly force harm, death or serious bodily injury. If you do believe that, what are you going to do except defend yourself? You're not going to die there. But if you're uncertain about that, well, then you should be uncertain about whether you're willing to shoot somebody over it. Because again, the consequences for you getting into that gunfight could be dying in the fight or spending the rest of your life in jail. There are worse things than that. Seeing your wife killed, seeing your kids killed or maimed. That's worse. I'd rather die than have that happen. I'd rather spend my life in jail than have that happen. But once I get past that very short list, there's not a lot of things in the world I'm willing to die for or spend the rest of my life in jail for. Certainly, the, like the earlier question, nothing that's in my car. Uh, so people need to think ahead of time, what am I prepared to die over or go to jail for the rest of my life over? To my mind, that is, and I'm not telling people where to draw that line. I don't tell people what to do. But I do want people to make an informed decision about where they draw that line and to think about where they draw that line before they're in the crisis of the moment. Because at that point, it's too late. We don't make better decisions under stress. We make worse decisions under stress. People need to think about it right now. And wherever they draw that line, that's up to them. And then they live with the consequences. But I would urge people, I mean, we, uh, uh, Crypto was kind enough to share the link to my free book. Folks, if, yeah. if you don't, if you're not willing to spend the shipping and handling to get an easy to read book, these legal boundaries are for use and force. I don't know what to tell you, man. I I can't make it cheaper than free. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, I, no, I, that's I true, guys. That. Yeah, yeah, it's up there, guys. It's free. So, uh, you know, he, you know, it's uh, go to my page or go to Andrew's page, and you'll see the link. And uh, yeah, so, um, you know. I have I have read it and um, I I definitely would encourage you guys to get it and uh, the shipping handling is not is not that much so um, Stephen uh, let's head over to you bud go ahead he fell asleep Stephen are you there <laughs> he he unmuted himself so uh, he's he he did that Stephen are you there you right Stephen tell him to take the duct tape off. <laughs> yeah, yeah right uh yeah that's like that's like you know hit the phone twice if you're in trouble um steven are you there um all right no, he's, he's in trouble <laughs> well we'll try um well oh, he's muting and oh. unmuting so i don't know so maybe it's the internet so we'll try it all right we'll, we'll go to um yeah he bounced down all right so andrew if it's okay with you we'll just do two more real quick um i'll go to michael uh, Michael, do you have a use of force question? And then I have Rob and then, uh, uh, we'll graciously let Andrew go. Uh, it's been two hours now. So Michael, go ahead, bud. Yeah, it's a general one, Andrew. I was just wondering if there's been any case that we could, you know, we'd enjoy looking at that you've seen in your experience that was either, you know, for or against just a, a case that you thought was a big case and it went one way or the other that you, I, I would say disagreed with. Uh, Ooh, put, yeah, I mean, it, it happens put, putting them on the spot. Oof. Yeah, I mean, it, it happens all. I mean, so here's the thing from from my perspective, I look at all of this from a very professional eye. And when it mm -hmm. comes to the law, the, the self-defense law is not super complicated and it's not all that ambiguous. It's very old law, self-defense law. It's relatively stable and fairly consistent across all 50 states. What's complicated is not the black letter of the law. So that tends to get applied fairly reasonably. Uh, 
what what's complicated is the real world are the facts. Mm -hmm. The facts are often highly ambiguous. I mean, we talked about this with the Texas shooting off the porch, right? Uh, because I've seen a certain video that didn't, to my view, show the victim advancing, and other people have said, tell me they've seen a video where he was advancing. Tiny changes in facts make for enormous changes in legal outcomes. Uh, so to my mind, whether or not that guy was even leaning his weight forward to advance, that would completely change the legal analysis. But it's the jury, not the lawyers, not the law, that is the finder of facts. And it's up to them, their, their perception of what they believe to have been proven or not proven beyond a reasonable doubt that determines how they will apply those facts to the black letter of the law. Um, so do I see cases where, you know, if I were looking at the facts, I might interpret them differently? Well, sure, that happens all the time. That would happen every time you had a different jury. Uh, are there cases where the law is misapplied by courts? Yeah, that happens all the time, too. If that didn't happen, we wouldn't need appellate courts. Right. Uh, so it, it's not uncommon. I would caution people uh, that the, the rate of reversal in the appellate court system, if you've been convicted of trial, is less than 1%. Um, so I always say appeals are for losers. <laughs> I mean, both in the sense that you lost the trial, that's why you're there. And also now everything, the whole deck is stacked against you. You know, when you're at trial, you're presumed innocent until you're proven guilty. All the legal presumptions are in your favor. But once you're found guilty at trial, when you're appealing, the opposite is true. All It's presumed that you're guilty. It's presumed that the jury got it right. Right. Um, and that's why that's why appeals are I often hear people talk about appeals as if it's some kind of do over of the trial. It could not be more the opposite, folks. You're, you're deep in a hole uh, if you're appealing a conviction. Yeah, it's tough. And the only I mean, not the only ones, but the but the few or more often that I've seen tends to be actually a mess up in the jury instructions. That's very usually, common. Right. That's yeah. why judges don't like to modify the jury instructions. Yeah. They. What, yeah. So. Right. So that's why I think we had a sp our last space. I was asking someone about uh, what was the case? Oh, uh, it was Steve Bannon. And Julia was talking about the jury instructions in the charge conference. And I was asking about the jury instructions, if anyone changed them, because there were things the judge wanted to put in for them to not to not, I guess, not take into account in their deliberations but yeah jury instructions um you know they come from the court of appeals and uh you know or or if or if you're in the state they come from the florida supreme court or you know right. wherever you're whatever state you're in so that's where they come and you know once you start changing them around and things can get very very tricky there yeah All i mean right. they're always customized for the facts of the case you know right. you insert the party's names and if, if often they have many sections and if a section doesn't apply to the facts it's not right. included for the jury but if if you start changing the law of the mm -hmm. jury instructions that's by far the most common way for a trial court to get reversed yeah i agree and by the way if you're convicted and you go on appeal and and you win on appeal and your conviction gets reversed. That's not being found innocent. <laughs> right. That just you just got to do it again. Through the whole thing again. <laughs> right. You just got to do it again. That's all. You, yeah. It's just, it's just come back because, you know, maybe, uh, maybe literally the judge or, you know, against, uh, you know, against the defense counsel's objection, the prosecution got one sentence in, which should not have been in the jury instructions yeah. and everything comes back. So all those videos get to be played again. The DNA person comes back. So yeah, you're absolutely And by the right. way, in my, in my world, if, if we're working a murder or a manslaughter case, a killing case, people don't understand how expensive these things get. It's very easy to burn through a couple of hundred thousand dollars in legal defense expenses before you get to trial. Folks. Absolutely. Uh, and so just imagine how much money you would spend to avoid being convicted and sentenced to prison for the rest of your life without possibility of early release. It's pretty much everything. And you spend everything, everything you can beg, borrow and steal. You sell your home, you sell your business, you cash out your retirement, you cash out your kid's college fund and you get convicted and you appeal and you win your appeal. That's amazing. That's unbelievable. That's winning the lottery. And now you're just going back for another trial. How many resources do you think you have left for a second trial? You have right. nothing left for a so second trial. So sign up at ccwsafe.com using code LOSD10. <laughs> <laughs> Very kind of you. Yes. So, so let me ask you, Andrew, real quick, um, before I hop to Rob and Patriot, um, a question I had, which um, obviously came into my thought process after I left prosecution and i'm not sure what space it came up in but we we're talking about this here um so you just made a great point right you spend everything 
and this is where you're left, right? As yeah. the government or the state, whatever it is, um, if I send my stuff to the FBI, well, it doesn't cost me anything. They, yep. The FBI is going to do it for me. Yep. If if I send the DNA down, if I send the, you know, all that stuff, that stuff is free for me. Yeah. You know, and all it, you guys are getting paid to be there anyway. Right. I'm getting paid anyway. So it doesn't matter. Now, obviously, as if the defense attorney wants, well, then we have to do a chain of custody. We have to go in there. You have to bring your expert. You got to pay for it. All this stuff is costly. So here's my question. What is your thought if uh, the state or the federal government, so the feds, DOJ, take you to trial, you win. What are your thoughts on attorney fees or uh, some sort of civil shifting statute applied to criminal cases? Yeah, so I'm so much in favor of that that I've actually uh, proposed, oh, really? uh, not, not really for me to pursue, but for someone, because I don't do this, but for someone to pursue legislatively, something I call Kyle's Law, which I, I came up with after the Rittenhouse uh, acquittal. Uh, because there are these cases where the prosecution, there's literally zero evidence inconsistent with innocence. I mean, there's no rational way that a prosecution can prove, disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt, which is their burden. And they right. know it going in. That's their burden. To get a conviction, they have to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. There's no way that was going to happen in Rittenhouse rationally. Now, what they're hoping for is that 10% chance right that you put the most innocent person in front of a jury there's a 10 percent chance they'll get convicted that's what they're hoping for but they know they can't do it on the legal merits it was the same with the george zimmerman trial i watched every minute of both those trials and that zimmerman trial there was literally zero evidence inconsistent with innocence no way they were ever going to prove guilt beyond reasonable doubt it's my position that when a prosecutor knows that that's his burden Mm -hmm. If he goes through the trial and the defendant is acquitted, so he was not proven guilty, or rather self-defense was not disproven, beyond a reasonable doubt, the jury should be given a special jury form that asks the jury, obviously, you believe this defendant, self-defense was not disproven beyond a reasonable doubt. Do you believe it was disproven by even half the evidence? Half, which is far short of what the prosecution would have required for a conviction. Mm -hmm. And if that was not proven by even half, I would hold the prosecutor personally liable for that defendant's legal expenses because wow. he knows what his burden is. It's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So and not if he gets, he can't even come anywhere close to that. He right. ought not be bringing that defendant to trial. No, I agree. So are you saying the office or saying the actual prosecutor? The actual prosecutor. Wow. Okay. The so person personally making the decision. What, okay, so quick question, follow up on that though. What if the actual, let's just go with state. What if the Because the DA, process for these defendants is completely destructive. I mean, George Zimmerman uh, no, was acquitted of all charges. He did, he literally did absolutely nothing wrong as mm -hmm. found by the jury. And but yet what his if, life was completely destroyed. He lost his marriage. He lost his job. For a good 10 years after that, he was a broken man. All that crazy mm -hmm. stuff. We heard, and I, I know George now. I didn't know him at the time, but I've met him since. All that crazy stuff George did after the trial, that was not George Zimmerman before the trial. That was George Zimmerman afflicted with terrible PTSD. I mean, the state of Florida broke him. Yeah. Just imagine if you were him and you had done nothing wrong and they were threatening to put you in prison for the rest of your life without possibility of early release. So even though he got acquitted, the process itself was such a brutal punishment and by the way, in that in that particular trial, the prosecutor, Andrea Corey, she withheld evidence from the defense. She acted in the most contemptible, despicable, corrupt mm -hmm. way possible. And she was never held accountable. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that is, you know, you know that is unacceptable. Let me ask you, though, to a, to be a little more my question follow up. Do you so what if the DA wants this person charged, but the ADA is simply the person trying the case? Is it the person who makes the charging decision or the person who tries the case? Uh, what 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 should we do with an ADA who's ca I mean, wh what do we do with the Nazi prison guards? Do we right. just say, well, your boss told you to do it, so that makes it okay? Okay, so are we going with only the most egregious cases where it could not be proven then? That, We're not going. We're not going uh, on coin flips then. No, no. If it's say say it's a close call, so let's pretend right. uh, disproving self defense beyond a reasonable doubt requires like a, like a ninety percent of the evidence. Right. 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 Well, all right. So you don't get ninety. So it's a, it's an acquittal. But you got eighty. That's not enough for an acquittal. But come on, you were you were within shouting distance, or you got right. seventy, 
or you got 60 or you got 55. That's all good as far as I'm concerned. But okay. if you can't even get 50, you knew you were not close to getting a you. conviction on the merits. Okay. So, so, so essentially you're talking about, um, so when I'm using this as a framework as bad faith. To, to flag, yes, politically motivated persecutions. Right. So politically motivated and or bad faith. If those two come and you're found not guilty, then you would have that special verdict form. And then, yep. okay, got it. So what is, essentially we're asking the jury, do you believe this prosecution was undertaken in bad faith? And if they right. believe it was, that prosecutor should damn well be held accountable. Okay, I can I can get on board. Why not just though, why not if you beat them? I mean, think about civil. In civil, obviously, no, because there's always entirely. close calls. No, there's 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 always again, there's noise in the system. So Right, I, but if you win and you've lost everything to win, why not get money back from the government? Oh, I'm not sure how what I'm saying is different. Well, no, no. What I'm no, okay, so what what I'm gathering that you're saying is that it's politically motivated and or bad faith. You should have known you're going to lose. What I'm saying. Oh, oh, because because let's be fair. An acquittal doesn't mean you didn't do it. Right, it, right, it, 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 right. You're absolutely right. It doesn't. An, an acquittal means they couldn't prove you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. If they can't even prove it by fifty percent, which would be the civil standard, that really means you didn't do it. I mean, they just don't believe you did it. Would so, but right, but would you be on so so uh, taking away the fifty percent? Would you be on board that obviously, you know, it doesn't say innocent on the verdict form; it just says not guilty, right? right. So we all so we all know it doesn't mean you, you didn't necessarily do it. Would you be on board though if someone won if they got a not guilty? Would you, however they got it, would you be on board with fee shifting? No, I don't think so. Okay. Okay. I don't think so, because I think there's other protective measures people can take, like CCW Safe, for example, right. uh, to cover those kinds of legal expenses. It's um, And it, let's face it, if someone's really that poor, they're getting a public defender anyway. Yeah. And uh, you know what, though, as far as public but defenders I'm, go, I'm most worried. I'm not worried about where a prosecutor's acting in good faith and he just loses the case. That, that happens. Well, maybe not as much as I would like, but it, it happens. Right. It happens. Um, but I'm, I'm really worried about the clearly bad faith, politically motivated prosecutions, because for the prosecutor, for a bad prosecutor. Right. And by the way, folks, I, I know lots of prosecutors. The ones I know are fantastic civil servants. They're doing God's work, trying to deliver justice for their community. Uh, mm. They're not bad actors, but there are bad ones out there. And for them, there is literally no downside to politically persecuting someone. They right. either they either win the conviction, in which case they can tell everyone, see, I was right all along, even right. if the conviction was a result of noise, or they lose and they can tell their political side of the team, uh, hey, at least I fought the good fight. So right. it's nothing but upside for them. There is no, no downside. You're and, right. and when there's nothing but political incentive for them to act in a bad faith fashion, human beings are going to be human beings. And some of them will act in a bad faith fashion because there are no consequences for doing so. Right. Yeah. And we haven't even got into a deep, uh, a deep conversation about and or judge just because you put a robe on doesn't mean that you're not partisan. So um, anyway, let's go real quick. I, I, I know you have to go. We'll go to Robin Patriot real quick. And then, Andrew, uh, I, I, we'll wrap it up there for you. So thank you so much for tonight. Rob, go ahead, buddy. OK. Hey, thanks for bringing me up. So I have a request and then I have a question. My request is, I sent a story, Mark, to you, the co-host. Would you send that to Andrew, please? Uh, I did a friend request you guys. Rob, you said you sent me, a, me something? Yes, please. I I'll sent a you a private message. Please read that, and please send the copy of that to Andrew. I'll have a look, Rob. All right, thank you. My question is, if... A county attorney commits prosecutorial misconduct in a case. Is that considered as use of force? No, no, no. A use of force is a use of force. And mm -hmm. and who says it's prosecutorial misconduct? You or, or it, some body in authority has determined that? Um. Well, that's what, what I'm determining in my case. I I went to prison uh, back in the 1990s, and I lost a trial. And in my trial, the county attorney uh, didn't turn over exculpatory evidence in my case to my attorney. And what we learned is that the detective in my case 
four years prior to that, uh, was reprimanded for falsifying documents in another case. And under the Brady v. Maryland, it was requi- it's required by the county attorney to turn over all exculpatory evidence. Yeah, uh, of, he, of course. And- Listen, you're, you're absolutely right on the legal merits, and I'm completely sympathetic. The, the problem is trying to refight these battles retroactively mm-hmm. is 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 an uphill fight, my friend. Uh, the way the legal system works is you get that basically that one chance to fight the fight. And it sounds like you did it in the 1990s and they screwed you. Well, uh, no, but no, I didn't find this out until this year. I, I understand. And I, I don't know what to tell you. That's not my area of the law. So you would, you would okay. need to talk to somebody who could follow up well, that kind of misconduct. And like I said, I, I, I wasn't assuming that you knew that, but I wanted Mark to at least send you a copy of the kit. You know, it's it's a newspaper article. That's all. Okay, Rob. Thank you for taking my question. Sure thing. Thanks, Rob. All right. Uh, Patriot, the floor is yours. Wow. Really awesome conversation here, guys. Thanks for putting it on. Sorry I'm late to the party. Um, My my statement and question are... uh, you know, I looked into uh, CCW uh, uh, insurance, and my God, is it expensive. I'm not a rich man. I'm a working stiff with a disabled wife, and I, I don't know if I could afford that one way or another. I know you're going to say, how can you not afford it? And I No, I no, no. I, listen, I, I don't urge people to get any kind of uh, quote-unquote self-defense insurance coverage. I hate to use the word insurance because none of these things are actually insurance, but that's what everybody calls them. So I'll just say quote-unquote. Uh, I, I don't urge anyone to get it. Uh, like any other similar insurance type product, you know, what dif- and first of all, none of these things are perfect for everybody. Second of all, not everyone needs the coverage. Second of all, uh, third of all, it's not appropriate for everyone at the price they charge. So it's it's a very individualized decision. Uh, I wouldn't assume that everybody ought to get this. And the truth is, you know, the prospects that you'll actually need it for any normal law-abiding person are pretty darn low. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's it's a risk mitigation decision that everyone has to make on an individual basis. But if, if you if you couldn't afford it, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. Oh, I'm not losing any sleep. If I have to uh, pull the trigger, it's going to be right with with forethought and uh, understanding. Like you said before, is my life or my uh, loved one's life is in danger, and I'm willing to accept those two consequences. Yep. Let me let me move on to my next. Uh, I don't know if it's a statement, a question, or what, but uh, maybe you can shed some light on what's going on in California about the releasing of uh, uh, everybody's information that had yeah. uh, CCW well. from the 1990s to present. I'm kind of ambivalent about it because if the, if the bad guy does use that list as a pick list for houses, uh, he's going to pick my neighbor's house because he doesn't have a CCW. Yeah, maybe. I mean, listen, I would say this. It's just like with the January 6th defendants. When you elect bad people into positions of authority, these are the kinds of decisions you get. This was not a leak by accident. Uh, This was obviously intentional. Uh, I have a lot of friends in California who have concealed carry permits, and they all called me when this happened and wanted to know what they can do. And the fact is, there's not a damn thing you can do, really. Uh, I would say that if you're on that list and you're concerned that uh, someone might use that list to identify your home as a place they can come and steal guns, well, that's knowledge in your head subjective knowledge that would be relevant to you evaluating an apparent threat near your home. I would just make sure you document now that you have that knowledge. Don't just try to claim it after the fact. But you might see people wandering around your home that last year you wouldn't have thought much about. And maybe this year you do get a little suspicious because you know these records have been released. That would be a reasonable difference in perception. Yeah, that's a great point, Andrew. Um, nuance. Go ahead, buddy. You have a comment? Yeah, to, to Patriot's point, it wasn't just CCW information. Uh, I believe it was like Dross information. It was a lot of things. It wasn't just CCW. So it was, it affected, I think, uh, like millions of Californians. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that place out there is, is pretty amazing. Um, so Andrew, uh, 
do you have four minutes or you got to get going? What's, 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 what's timeline looking like? For yeah. You? I mean, I got three and a half minutes. I can go to eight thirty. <laughs> you got three and a half. Okay. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, let me see here. Uh, uh, Steven, I brought you back up. Uh, is your mic working now? Can can you unmute? Yeah, yeah, I think it should be working. Sorry about that. So my question No was, problem. Go ahead. Someone had, you know, brought up January 6th in terms of, you know, uh, possession of weapons for, for pretrial release. Uh, my question was, you know, some of the defendants have sort of made this claim. Uh, you know, they're charged with assault and they say, oh, you know, I was I was trying to stop, you know, the police from assaulting someone. So my question is, is it ever, are you ever going to, you know, get a, uh, basically, is there ever a legal claim of self-defense against a police officer? Yes. yes. If the police officer is using unlawful force, you're privileged to prevent the use of unlawful force against you if you're an innocent actor or some other third party who may be an innocent victim of that unlawful force. But I can tell you, it's an uphill argument. Because mm -hmm. police are effectively presumed to be using force lawfully because that's what society licenses them to do when it gives them the badge. Police are, generally speaking, allowed to be the initial aggressor in the use of force for lawful purposes. So the argument you would make is, well, they exceeded the bounds of lawful purposes, making their use of force unlawful. The unlawful force you'd be privileged to defend yourself against, but it's not an easy argument to win. Yeah, it's tough. Um... Michael, comment on that? Yeah, it was more of a comment and, and and would love to hear Andrew's thing on that. It wasn't that, I mean, there's been many cases, of course, but I know a lot of people don't even know it. But in that Breonna Taylor situation, the boyfriend uh, did shoot back at the police. And as far as I know, he was found, you know, innocent of that. So it sounds somewhat similar. You know, you have the right to do that in, in, you know, in your own property, et cetera. But uh, any comments on that, Andrew? Well, we, we have to be careful with that particular case. Anytime there's a politically energized case, it can be hard to tell if the decisions are being made for political reasons or, or based on legal merit. Uh, there are many cases where police, say, get warrants. Typically, they're drug warrants, so there are no knocks in the middle of the night, and they go to the wrong address. In good faith, right? They, they were given the wrong address on the warrant, uh, and they start kicking in some dude's door, and the, it's the wrong house. So the guy inside the house is like, holy shit, I'm the victim of a home invasion, <laughs> right. and he starts shooting at the cops. Uh, if he can convince the jury that he had a genuine good faith and reasonable belief that he was shooting at unlawful actors, not at police, that's a justified use of defensive force. What, you know, we're not required to make perfect decisions in self-defense. We're required to make reasonable decisions in self-defense, and they're assessed from the perspective mm -hmm. of the reasonable defender. So what matters is not whether the people coming in are actually cops. What matters is whether they were reasonably perceived as not being cops. If that's the case, that, that's a lawful use of defensive force, just as if they were actually home invaders. But be careful. Again, it could be hard to prove. If everyone's screaming, cop, 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 and there's flashing lights outside, and you know, then it becomes hard to sell to a jury that a reasonable person would have failed to have perceived them as law enforcement. Yeah, that's true. If they're, uh, you know, if you get 10 of those guys coming in all yelling that and they got the sirens blasting outside. It's, uh, you know, but, uh, yeah, you know, crypto, I, I'm so biased. You're like my favorite, but Andrew, damn, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he, he's great, man. He is, he is a great attorney and a great person. And, uh, you know, it was an absolute pleasure. So here we have, uh, let's go 30 I, seconds. I can always tell when my ex-wife is not in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's go with 30 seconds. Reliable. Go ahead. Yes. Hi. My question is for any of the lawyers here that can answer this. Um, so I'm based out of Brooklyn, New York right now. And um, as uh, you might know, that New York is now a shall issue state, but that doesn't make New York City shall issue. So <laughs> <laughs> and so basically, uh, if you have a New York State carry permit and you're carrying in New York City, you're going to get arrested for felony possession of a firearm um, because New York City, uh, you have to go through NYPD to get a um, a permit, and you know what they're going to tell you at uh, NYPD? Oh, yeah, you can get a permit from New York State. Like, go to the state. They're, they're shall issue. We're not shall issue. Like, uh, how do you go around that? How do you get that solved to carry a, a gun in New York City? Yeah, uh, move out. 
Yeah. I, I mean, I'm sorry, man. I, I'm completely sympathetic. As I said earlier, I, I'm a Second Amendment absolutist. I believe all these gun laws preemptively applied to law abiding, mentally sound American citizens are facially unconstitutional. That will not keep New York City from not locking you up in a jail cell. Uh, that's, that, that, you know, and they have another the one. power to do that, and they will do it if they want to, and they want to. Now, uh, I lived an, in New York. I, I, yeah. Listen, back in the day, I was a diesel mechanic in Harlem, New York, before Harlem was a nice place. OK, this was back in the 1980s. It was a dump about as violent <laughs> as you could believe. And most of us working as mechanics in that shop had guns in our toolboxes. Yeah. We had no damn permits. Nobody had a permit. Uh, but a car a day came into the lot, popped the trunk and offered us any guns we wanted. Uh, for 200 bucks or 300 bucks or 400 bucks. That's still how people in New York buy guns today. Yeah. Well, I, I watched Serpico as well. Um, uh, <laughs> now, and here's another question. Um, so, or that's actually a statement. Um, for anyone who ever wants to travel to New York with a gun, don't, don't fly into the city because uh, NYPD monitors people who a- apply for guns. And then once you pick up your gu- your gun uh, from like your, your luggage from, you know, the, the luggage pickup, they're going to arrest you. That, that's what's going to happen. NYPD yeah. arrests people from bringing in guns into the city. The, the gun is on the manifest for the airplane. Yeah. All right. You look so at when that. you declare your gun at check-in, you have to check your gun. You got to declare a gun. It goes on the manifest. And the NYPD airplane. monitors that. Yes. So they know there's a gun in that bag. By the way, if you're ever on a flight, you're not intending, say, to go to New York or New Jersey or Massachusetts <laughs> or one of these horrible gun control states, and your mm-hmm. flight gets diverted and you land in New York. And they tell you to go pick up your baggage off the baggage carousel. Do not, under any circumstances, touch that bag if there's a gun in it. The moment you touch it, you're in possession. All right? You can leave it with the airline. They're a common carrier. It's not breaking any laws for them to remain in possession of your bag. But the moment you lay a finger on it, you are in possession of that gun in the jurisdiction of New York City, and they will prosecute you for it. Yeah. Yeah. And Tell the airline they have to keep the bag. So dirty. It's amazing. And with all this shit going on over there, you know, that's what, the, you know, that's what they'll prosecute. Uh, so. another, another night or maybe, maybe after An- Andrew leaves, I'll tell you my airport gun stories. But uh, Andrew, uh, I appreciate uh, you coming on. I had a great exchange with you. Uh, and it's and once in a while, you may not know this, but once in a while, you even like one of my tweets. So, uh, you okay. know, I, I, keep, I keep an eye out for that, too. So uh, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, so just so people know, I have like a 30-second attention span on social media. So <laughs> if I see a tweet I like, I say I like it. If I see a tweet I don't like, I may say I don't like it. But I have no memory. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't hold any grudges or anything. So if, ever, if I've ever said anything mean, uh, it was just in the moment. I, it's not That should not inhibit us from having further conversation. So right. I, awesome. I just apologize beforehand. Awesome. Well, Andrew, thank you so much. It's uh, 1035 East Coast here. Uh, I have court tomorrow, so we're going to wrap this up here. But uh, right, absolute, absolute pleasure. I'll, I'll talk to you on DM. And uh, thanks, thanks for coming in tonight, brother. All right, yeah, follow him night, on YouTube. Safe. Law of Self-Defense on YouTube. Yeah, I'm yeah. everywhere. You, Absolutely. Your Law of Self-Defense, you'll find me.